Welcome, everyone. This is Torah Portions. I'm Sean, your host, and you're watching this on Kingdom in Context. I want to thank you all for being here today. We're going to be going through uh, Genesis 12 through 17, finishing up those chapters. It's going to be wonderful. We'll have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. And I'm going to be joined by a friend and a brother in the faith as our guest today to help me with this. This is Wes Blaze from Wes Blaze Music. Shalom, brother. Thankful to be here. It's always an honor. I appreciate you. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, brother. I'm glad we get to go over these together and we get to do it in the presence of our brothers and sisters in the live chat. We got quite a few people here. I want to say hello to Jaron. Uh, Jaron, I think I'm saying that right. Marcia, Marcia uh, Windfeather, Hannibal, Mary Slattery is back. Bob Cleveland, Chico1985 is back. Augie Boggy Bull, that's a fun name. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Carrie yeah. M. GR Cleveland. Tyler Porter. Crispy Chips. Welcome, everybody. A lot of people. James King is back. Anita Vega. Appreciate everybody, all your support, guys. I appreciate your comments uh, of encouragement um, that you send to us. We obviously, big shout out for everyone that is uh, following along on our Patreon or supporting us through the links in the video description below. You guys are awesome. If these things are blessing you, that's how we give you an opportunity to show love. We are not Levites. This is not a temple. This is simply just believers trying to figure scripture out and encourage you with it in your life. So if you love what we're doing, you want to keep us going, that's how you do it in the video description below. Um, other than that, man, I'm excited to jump in these chapters. What about you, Wes? What's up? What's new with you recently, Wes? Me too, brother. Oh, we just did the season finale of Uncommon Ground and our live stream got hacked in the middle of the broadcast. I don't know if you guys checked that out yet, but if you haven't seen it, it was it was crazy. I'd recommend yeah. going and see it. episode 25, it, Uncommon Ground on West Blaze Music. Yeah, uh, it was a great finale, and um, the hacking was was uh, such a unique part of the show. So do, go check that out on West Blaze Music channel if you haven't seen it already. You don't want to miss that one. So it's exciting. We had fun. It is exciting. Um, and as just as a quick update, guys, you probably saw in the advert uh, opening up the show, we are still working on the contextual study guide, and uh, we just released a couple more books recently um, for everybody. And so... Uh, go again. That's if you want early access to that, because it's, we're going book by book, 100 plus books throughout scripture. And we're going to be compiling that into a finished, a, fin, a final finished printable product. Say that fast. Right. And uh, then once that's done, you'll be able to literally, you know, purchase a physical hard copy or download an e-copy. Um, but in the meantime, if you want early access to to the books as I'm completing them and compiling them, you get that only on Patreon and the instructions and details are in the video description below. So go check that out, guys. Um, but let's jump into Genesis 12. This is where we're going to start today. And uh, I'm excited, guys. We got a lot of stuff going on here. And Genesis 12, 1 through 4. I'll start reading. Mm -hmm. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your kindred, your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had directed him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. And Abraham took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions and the people they had acquired in Haran and set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the Oak of Morah at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your offspring. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, Abraham moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With, this, with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east, there he built an altar to, to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on toward the Negev. Now, there was famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, Look, I know that you're a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Please say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and on account of you my life will be spared. So when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. When Pharaoh's officials saw Sarai, they commended her to him, and she was taken into the place of Pharaoh. He treated Abram well on her account, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. The Lord, however, afflicted Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and asked, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister, so that I took her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. 
Then Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning Abram, and they sent him away with his wife and all his possessions. So this is kind of interesting, Wes. We have a quite a unique, um, quite a unique turn of events. A couple of things I wanted to point out is just how many times he builds an altar in this chapter. It does. It's almost like he's performing priestly duty. Oh no, we lost Wes. <laughs> I guess we'll call back in. But yeah, exactly what Les, Wes is talking about. This is why at the very beginning, I'm actually go back to that real quick. At the very beginning of the, of the chapter, the promise in verse uh, 2, where Yahweh says to Abram, I will make your name great. That's It's not just to make him a, a well-renowned businessman. It wasn't to make him a celebrity. That was a term for authority. That's what that word name in Hebrew means. It's a term for authority. So how he's going to make Abram's name great is not because he wants Abram to have just a bunch of uh, uh, recognition. We got Wes back. Hey, welcome back, brother. Sorry about that. It's all right, man. <laughs> so how the father makes Abram's name great, which is a, his, a reference to his priestly authority, is that he's going to make him a blessing to other people. And that is the whole point of a righteous priest doing the ways of Yahweh and having authority over people to administer atonement to them and bless them in their life. That's that's kind of the idea. That's So even in this language, Wes, growing up in church, no one ever explained this to me. No one ever shared with me, hey, like he's not just trying to make Abram a celebrity or a great renowned businessman, right? He's not trying to, he's not trying to make him like a, a Jeff Bezos or a Donald Trump or an Elon Musk, right? He's not trying to make him some celebrity icon of any kind. No, he's, it's a priestly authority. That's what the word name is referring to. And he will be a, so specifically, he can be a blessing to other people in that office because he's teaching and doing the ways of Yahweh. What are That's your right. thoughts, brother? Yeah. And so um, it says that he was counted righteous, right? I'm reminded of Romans 4, where it's talking about how faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. We have this idea introduced that because you believe it's a righteous act, a righteous belief to have, to believe in yeah. the God of creation. Most yeah. die. Yeah, it is. And and that's where in addition to believing and going through that, he was we're getting this unique pattern in, in Genesis 12 of him like going on a journey and you know moving different places. And it does mention there's Canaanites in the land. I think we're gonna pro I think we don't jump into that till Genesis 20. He interacts with Abimelech and and uh, his general as well. But uh, he's so he's amongst enemies or what are supposed traditionally have been his enemies, right? People that are against Yahweh, they're worshiping bells, they're worshiping other other gods. And uh, he's trying to remain righteous and be a blessing to people. So this is I think this is kind of fitting for us in our day personally. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting interesting. So I got the summary here set up. Genesis 12. Abram realizes Yahweh is the almighty creator of heaven and earth and the one true God. Uh, this is actually something we get expounded to us in Jubilees, which is the parallel account to Genesis. And in Jubilees 12, it goes on to explain how, while still in Babylon, Abraham realizes idolatry is worthless and that there, there is one true God who creates all of heaven and earth. And he, he has his own conversion moment and asks God to reveal himself to him, and, and Yahweh does. And it's a beautiful thing. And this is why I love the Apocalypse of Abraham. That book really elaborates on some of these events and gives you more details into the insight of Abraham and where he was coming from with his father, as well as Jubilees, right? Right. Yeah, it's great. So then that's actually at 14 years old. Now, Genesis kind of picks up when he's around in his 70s. And this is the part that I think a lot of people don't realize is that by the time Yahweh instructs Abraham to leave Haran and sojourn in Canaan, he had already left Chaldea. So this is why there's that general reference from Abraham to, um, excuse me, from Yahweh to Abraham saying, you know, I called you out of Ur of Chaldea, but he made a couple stops along the way. He actually spent quite a few years with his father and his whole family that had moved from Chaldea to Haran, uh, which is in that, um, as far as I understand, it's like northern Israel, kind of like that connected what modern day right now would be like um, north Israel uh, connected to Babylon or connected to Iraq area. So. Then he moves from there down south to goes down toward Bethel and uh, the Well of Oath and then towards the Negev, even further south. So he's we're, we're following him on this journey as father's taking him different places in his life. But by the time he gets into Canaan, um, there is famine in the land. So then he has to move all the way over to Egypt. So he's like, you know, that's a, quite a journey. It is. He was so. definitely a sojourner of the land looking for a promised land to come. 
Yes. Yeah. He knew every, every place he's moving inside that land wasn't going to be a permanent resident forever for him. And it was not going to be the actual fulfillment of what's being promised to him through these chapters that we're going to read. So that, that keep that in mind as we go forward. We also see once he encounters Pharaoh, he's going to get, you know, Pharaoh, his, the, the household of Pharaoh is struck with plague because here's the thought. Um, Wes, do you think that Abram was, how, how do you, how do you feel about Abram's behavior with Pharaoh and portraying his wife as his sister, afraid they're going to kill him and, what do you think about that? It's interesting you bring that up because I had a conversation with a non-believer recently who brought this exact moment and event up as to say that whereas they didn't understand what was going on, apparently, because they were trying to say that the, the God of the Bible condones incest, whereas, you know, that he was thinking that Abraham really married his sister. And so then when I tried to explain to him and show him the passages where they were setting this up so that the that they didn't die, so that they weren't killed that they had to, you know, put on this charade. The unbeliever then went on to say, well, then that would mean that God condones lying. And so I, it was a difficult conversation, but what would you say to somebody that, you know, would one want to twist that then to say that, well, okay, if he doesn't condone incest, he condones the lying here. Well, I know that it was a tradition that he, that Sarai was his stepsister by marriage through his father's second wife. That's where the tradition comes from. Um, is that actual scripture? I don't know. Um, but I do know that even if it was his, I, I doubt it was his true sister, but even if it was, um, as far as what he's telling, he's definitely shading this because he's afraid. So an angel did not show up to Abraham and say, you should do this with Pharaoh. This is Abraham's decision. Mm -hmm. So for the unbeliever who's trying to find a way to discredit the scriptures, they forget the Bible's not all, you know, this is why context matters, right? This is Abraham making this choice. This is not Yahweh telling Abraham to make this choice, right? So this is a frail, weak, fearful individual. Yeah, he's he shows great moments of courage, and, but he's also human, right? He has his own moments of lack, right? He gets caught lacking in, in his fear in this moment where he's thinking, they're just going to kill me and I can't stop them uh, because we need food, so we got to go down here. I think this is fascinating because of the parallel that we see once we get later in the in Genesis to the story of Shechem with Simeon and Levi and Jacob and and how, you know, if you look into Jubilees, it says that the men of Shechem did this on a regular occasion. Like this was kind of well known in the in the area that they would take a man's wife and kill the husband. And so this sphere is validated in Jubilees with the, 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 the behavior of other people in the region, you know, so um, and he came from the Canaanites and that's the, the region of people that they're dealing with with Shechem later on with Jacob and his sons. So it's interesting to me that, that that's to me, that's that back backstory motivation to why he would think I need to do this. The Egyptians are going to act the same way the Canaanites have been acting and they're going to, you're so beautiful, sweetie, that they're going to just going to just kill you, kill me and, and take you. But how interesting that Pharaoh actually acts righteously in this account, you know? Yeah. Who, the same if the same kind of situation or similar situation happens again later on in like chapter 26 happens twice with, with Abraham once with Isaac and there it is yeah 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 interesting it's interesting common right? theme yes sir so uh they that but as a result of this uh fear based miscommunication um Pharaoh shows that he's willing to serve Yahweh and or at least respect Yahweh and uh Abraham and Sarah kind of make out as a result of this with a whole bunch of new possessions. So that's interesting. So do you want to, if, unless there's anything else on chapter 12, do you want chapter 13? Yeah, absolutely. Make sure I got it pulled up here with you. Good to go. So Abram went up out of Egypt into the Negev, he and his wife and all his possessions and lot was with him. And Abram had become extremely wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. From the Negev, he journeyed from place to place toward Bethel until he came to the place between Bethel and Ai, uh, where his tent had formerly been pitched to the site where he had built the altar. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord, the authority of the Lord, right? Yeah. Now Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land was unable to support both of them while they stayed together, for they had so many possessions and they were unable to coexist. And there was discord between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land. 
So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no contention between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. After all, we are brothers. It is not the whole land before you. Now separate yourself from me. If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. And Lot looked out and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan all the way to Zoar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the whole plain of the Jordan for himself and set out toward the east. And Abram and Lot parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot settled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, sinning greatly against the Lord. After Lot had departed, the Lord said to Abram, Now lift up your eyes from the place where you are and look to the north and south and east and west. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk around the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live near the oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Mm, interesting. It surely is. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> this town is big enough for the two of us, is what Abram was saying there a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a good problem to have when your possessions are so great. You're like, yeah, we need more land and we got to split up, you know, and that's that's a good problem. Um, but further problems are going to happen because Lot chose to go down to the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're like, bro, it makes me wonder if they were as corrupt as we see later. You know, just makes me wonder. Um, and of course, that means there was land for sale in the region of the five cities of the plain. You know, just little practical details. You're like, I mean, surely he couldn't just, I mean, he didn't, it didn't say he took over through warfare. So I'm guessing that means there was available land somehow. Either that or he found some connections and people had some to spare. But yeah, it's like he, he bought it, especially since their resources were so vast. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe he did a, a, a situation where he's like, yeah, if I could you let my sheep graze in your land, I'll give you a portion at the market. You know, when I go to sell them, you know, kind of like renting the land. Either way, um, all I know is that he moves down to the worst place possible. But um, so we now we got Abraham and Sarai and the whole, the whole clan going back to Canaan. Right. And then once they're back in that region, uh, they try to settle near Bethel, which I think is interesting because of what happens later with Jacob and the angels and everything. And Jubilees 32 is kind of a fascinating. Um, as you talked about, Abraham and Lot, Lot do part ways because of their they need more space for their abundant livestock and resources. And then um, and then after it seems like Abraham moves again to Hebron and then builds another altar to Yahweh. So I'm guessing these there's no actual temple or standing building there. So I'm guessing these are like the outside altars made of unhewn stone. What would you think? Yeah, that's what that would have to be. Right. It doesn't say he built he builds a tabernacle. It doesn't say he builds a temple. It's just an altar. And so, yeah, it makes me wonder what, how, how the father honors, you know, where he says to like an Exodus, he says at the place where I, where I choose, where I put my name, he says. Yeah. And so it's almost like the father grants Abraham, you know, he, that he puts his name wherever Abraham chooses to go, maybe in that place of the altar. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and of course, th to me, there's a lot of information missing in these, because we're about to get to chapter 14, where. Abraham then goes to another guy who has seemingly another altar. You know, uh -oh. smoke, right. Yeah. So it's like, there seems to be a lot of information missing as far as the, um, and then the, just the, the fullness of the atmosphere of who's worshiping Yahweh and how established the practices of how to worship Yahweh were amongst the people in this region. Uh, because we, you know, what we read from last week's portions from 10 and 11, we've had the descendants of Shem running around. Abraham is not the only descendant of Shem. There's all these other guys and their descendants running around. And Abraham came out of Chaldea where he grew up for a, a decent amount of time. And then Haran. So he wasn't living around these other descendants of Shem. So there's like this whole other story. You know, if this were Game of Thrones, there's like a whole nother three episodes of a whole nother family line that we, we haven't seen yet. You know, that we may not, we won't see until we get to heaven apparently. But um, it's just like, there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening here. And then Abraham is about to start interacting with these other people in 14. Yeah. So 
I'd, I'd be interested to see all the flashback scenes to fill in the details as well. Right. It'd be interesting. It'd be a fun time when we get to the father. All right. So let's look at 14 real quick, unless there's anything else, Wes. No, sir. All right. So here in Genesis 14, 1 through 4, in those days, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariak, king of Elisar, Ketaleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, went to war against Bera, king of Saddam, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Ber Shanab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is in Zoar. The latter five came as allies to the valley of Siddam, that's in the Salt Sea. For twelve years they had been subject to Ketaloeomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Ketaloeomer and the kings allied with him and went out and defeated the Rephites in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shava Kiriathim, and the Horites in the area of Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is near the desert. Now, this is interesting. We'll have to make a note of this, Wes, because I'm pretty sure those are all Nephilim clans, according to Deuteronomy 2 and 3. Okay. So it's interesting that Kedileom is fighting them. And then in verse 7, then they turned back to invade in Mishpat, that is in Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Malachites, as well as the Amorites, who live in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bala, that's in Zoar, they marched out and arrayed themselves for battle in the valley of Siddam against Kedileom. Ketelah Elmer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariat, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of the Siddam was full of tar pits, and as the kings of Sanam and Gomorrah fled, some men fell into the pits, but the survivors fled to the hill country. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and they went on their way. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since Lot was living in Sodom. Then an escape came, an escapee came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were bound by treaty to Abram. And when Abram heard that his relative had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men in the household, and they set out in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his forces and routed Ketaleomer's army, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He retrieved all the goods, as well as his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the rest of the people. Abram after Abram returned from defeating Ketaleomer and the kings uh, allied with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, since he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not accept even a thread or a strap of a sandal or anything that belongs to you, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share for the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre. They may take their portion. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting chapter right here. It is. There was that Melchizedek character that you had mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, Mysterious Melchizedek guy, isn't he? A lot of people he, debate about who he is, what character, what is his real name. Some people yeah, say was, Shem, some say an angel. Go ahead. Yeah, they, I, I do not believe it's an angel. Um, it's, it's it's definitely human. And I think it's one of the big things that people seem to miss, which all of Exodus through Deuteronomy, as well as the book of Hebrews should explain to you, is that there is um, an order. All right. So the, the idea of this concept of an order was it was like a club. All right. It was a. You know, it was the in the order, meaning the instruction for that specific priesthood. And there was men within that order. It wasn't just one person. So this is where understanding the priesthood as a concept kind of helps dispel the idea that it was an angel that was just one person hanging around as a king of an entire city. Angels don't come down and, and be kings of cities. Like this was, a, <laughs> that's not what the way the father, that's not for angels. Like first Enoch 10 through 15 to clear that up for you. They live in heaven above. That's their place. Mankind has the earth, and this is this is where men, kings of men, reign on the earth over kingdoms, not angels. Um, and this is there's nothing in here that would allude this to being like a spiritual conversation. This is a real, tangible interaction between a king of Salem, Melchizedek, who's a priest, with Abraham, um, who's also a priest. And and here's the awesome part, Wes, in Jubilees 13, where this uh, where this interaction is parallel. 
it says that the tenth that Abraham brought forth to the Melchizedek, that he shared that with his priests, plural. The Melchizedek had priests, plural. So it's not just like there's one, no, it's a priesthood. It's a club of priests. It's an organization of priests all taught the same behavior of Yahweh. It's an order, as they would call it, the order of Melchizedek, as opposed to the order of Aaron. So it's a, it's kind of a big under, distinguishment, I should say, for people to understand the priesthood as a concept, so that when they see something like this, just as any priest would train the people below him to know what to do, just as in Jubilees tells us Abraham trained Isaac to know what to do, and then passed that down to Jacob to know what to do, you know, Jubilees 21. So the firstborn. Right. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. that would be the idea of why they would gather a priesthood. There's a collection of men dedicated in their heart to Yah that have to be taught how to minister at an altar before the Almighty so that the sacrifices are, are cooked properly, seasoned properly, uh filleted properly, right? Disposed of properly. The the uh sacrifices are shared with the people and the other priests properly, the burnt offerings are cooked properly for the father. So everybody has a good time at that fellowship meal. So that reminds me of a, I guess, a metaphor, an analogy you've used to explain the priesthood before in in the sense of if a king that was rich and powerful, um, you know, had some enemies, he wouldn't want just anybody preparing his food and his fellowship meals, right? It's similar to, I hate to compare it, but the presidency in the White House, they don't allow, supposedly, um, outside food to be cooked and brought in. They have chefs on hand, on staff, that are trusted to not poison the food and things like that, right? So that's right, I really that's enjoyed right. that. That that helped make sense of it for me. Good. Yeah, that's the people forget, like, you know, that this is a bad analogy. You gave a better analogy, but Hell's Kitchen, you know, where he's like, you know, yelling at his these chefs he's trying to train to do five star dining or whatever. Yeah. Like that's, you know, that there was no yelling at the other priest. But that's exactly what the high priest would do with the priest below him and make sure they understood the proper procedure of things. And so that's why there's a, a he did, you know, he a discipleship. He didn't call anybody an idiot sandwich. No, no, okay. he didn't say <laughs> the Passover lamb is raw. raw. <laughs> 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 good stuff. Good stuff. Also, that uh, when it said that he was bringing a tenth, that sounds that's oddly reminiscent of a long-standing commandment of the first fruits offering. Amen. That's right. Abraham knows the law. Genesis twenty-six five, Jubilees twenty-one. He teaches it to Isaac and Jacob. He knows. He's been taught the law. This is where Genesis Genesis twelve says an angel showed up and helped Abraham learn Hebrew so he could read the books of his fathers, both Enoch and his father Shem. So I think, that, and you know, the books passed down through Noah, and I think that they all knew proper behavior for bringing forward a tenth as tribute. You know, so this is amazing. Uh, we see David do this also when he takes spoils from war uh, in First Second Samuel. But wait, Moses didn't come down the mount with the law yet. <laughs> it's they already knew it, isn't it? <laughs> they already knew it. Yeah, I know. The audience knows what we're talking about. But if this is your first time seeing this, guys, the law is eternal. Father's instructions for behavior are consistent and the same throughout all of creation. And it's just that mankind has been struggling to learn and keep those learned behaviors throughout their generations, which is why it constantly has to renew that instruction through different generations that are wanting to learn them. Uh, so this is what we see with Abraham. He's a wonderful story. He wanted to learn them. He picked them up. He's teaching them. So it's great. Uh, so apparently, Kedel Laomer and Amraphel and this other guy, Title. I can't remember the other dude's name, but these these other four kings, they're going out, they're going from what looks like um, Elam, which is my understanding that's going to be across the Mesopotamia Sea. That is in Mesopotamia area, like close to uh, uh, Chaldea. And they're going to be going in, across the, Mesopot or the uh, Euphrates to the west, to, to the land of Canaan, and fighting all these clans, these Emim, these Horites, these Amicalites, like these... Nephilim clans that are mentioned in Numbers and Deuteronomy, also in Exodus 23. And what's, we're going to see it re repeated in Genesis 15 as far as a promised Abraham that Yahweh's like, I'm going to help you inherit all this land that these people are currently possessing. So it seems like those tribes were in conflict with other tribes in the area constantly as well. And I'm wondering, I, you know, it's tradition that Amraphel is another name for Nimrod or Nibrod. And that that was his uh, Mesopotamian King, name. King of Shinar. Hmm. Right. So I'm wondering if this is what it means in the Septuagint in Genesis 10, 8, when it talks about Nimrod becoming a, a, a giant hunter. And title King of Goyim 
that yeah. that word in Hebrew is oddly reminiscent of like Gentile, so, right? Yeah, it just means the nations, yeah, or a, a region called nation. So I don't know if it means if it's referring to an empire or if he actually had a a people group he called nation. So, right. Interesting title, like a wave or something. Right. Hmm. So those guys wanted to battle the giants that were already in the land, and they do take on the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. So it makes me wonder if the kings of Sodom, if there are giants in Sodom and Gomorrah, I think there was. It oh, yeah. seems to be. From what Jude tries to reference, I think it's in Jude verse 6, where it talks about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh as well. And I, it makes me wonder if they were involved in the same kind of practices like the the clans within Canaan doing that kind of stuff. So, um, and interesting. What are your thoughts, brother? How long would you say this is after the flood? From my understanding, Abraham is like 200 plus years after the flood. Okay. Yeah. So plenty of time for them to, uh, you know, practice the sorceries necessary to regenerate or to revive giants. Yeah. To make that become a thing again. So yeah, it would be entirely possible, especially since we still see them around right in David's time. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's this big fight. Abraham, uh, realizes that his his nephew lot was taken as spoils of that war as well as other people with lot and then this is just quite an epic little moment here where abraham is like all right bring me my horse tell the men to you know get their swords put on their shields you know strap up we're trying to we're gonna we're heading north and we're gonna chase down kettle omer which he apparently was was the one being paid tribute by these other kings until there was a rebellion he came to squash it so it's like abraham is is trying to take on the this guy okay. I, and he's, he's only got 318 men and that's fascinating to me um, because I don't know how many men Kettle Amor had left, but he had enough men left in order to take lot and other people captive and, and have control over them. Right. So yeah. it, it, it sounds like he had probably at least thousands of people in his army left after this big battle. And Abraham's like, yeah, all we need is 318. We got and the father. Lord, yeah. yeah. Right. The, the, the Lord's <laughs> with us. So, so they, it doesn't give us the details. That sounds like a wonderful movie to make in the future, the, the details of this night raid. But um, he does. So it's equal to 300, 318. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, three, 318, 300 uh, in Canaan. That'd be great. Um, I just think it's fascinating that he does bring a lot back. And then apparently after he uh, he goes to pay tribute to the, the Melchizedek, Sodom, the king of Sodom comes up and starts talking to Abraham. And I don't know if this is happening like at two different, it's, we're just getting a summary and it's like separated in time. But the way it reads, as we read it, it seemed like as soon as, or while Abraham is there with the Melchizedek, giving his tithe and doing this sacrifice, that the king of Sodom is just like standing in the backdrop, you know, and he's like, hey, I'll give you the, you know, I don't know if that's exactly, it could have been a separation between those two sentences of time where Abraham returns back to his land and the king of Sodom comes up and is like, hey, you know, I'll give you some some riches because of what you did. And he's like, nope, just want the food that my men ate and my men and the people. I don't want anything else from you, bro. And hmm. so he tells him to move on. And then um, so that's it's interesting that he doesn't want to associate with him. So that gives me more inclination to think that this guy is not just wicked, but there's like Jude infers like there's they're they're going after strange flash. There's their wickedness, as we see later in Genesis 19, is so bad. Abraham's like, bro, I, I don't want I don't even want this. I don't want you saying you bless me. I don't want a strap of sandal from you. You know what I mean? Makes sense. Yeah. Especially if that's only a few chapters away when that whole event happens. A lot is kidnapped by him. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever faced this in your life, um, Wes, but there is a principle that you don't always take money from certain people. Like you don't always accept a gift from everybody. It's a little point of wisdom. I think we're seeing Abraham exemplify some people cannot give a genuine gift it's all manipulation yeah yeah you i've know? seen that absolutely you, yeah it's a, as if if you accept that then you then have to put yourself you know subject yourself to bad treatment yeah and so yeah that's played out a lot of times in many yeah, people's lives so i don't know if people have, have i've never heard pastors talk about that in reference to that that event in genesis 14 but um 
that's what I would suggest people take away from that and why he's rejecting any kindness or what seems to be kindness or gratitude from the King of Sodom. I think Abram knows better. There's some people yeah. you don't interact with. Yeah. And it's always said too, when, and I don't, I'm not familiar with the practices of sorcery and witchcraft, but people do speculate that curses can be placed on exchanges yeah. or items. And so, yeah, you'd have to wonder if that wasn't maybe a possibility too. Yeah, well, we see that in Joshua 6, right? Where they take, that dude tries to hide something he stole from Jericho in, under his tent. And then plague breaks out and they're trying to figure out what's the cause of it. And, you know, and they get to that dude and he's got that thing under his tent. And he's like, I'm sorry. And they're like, yeah, burn it with fire. You gotta yeah. cleanse it. You got to cleanse that thing. And then this dude's, you know. So, yeah, there's, I don't, yeah. don't want to exactly call it a whole crux, but there's definitely something to do with something that's been dedicated to evil and consecrated to the enemy. That mm -hmm. the father has to either destroy or have it purified before it can be. Accepted by the is. righteous, you know. Good stuff. Yeah. You want 15? I'll take it. Yes, sir. All right, brother. Transitions are going quickly, smoothly, by the way. After Good. these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram replied, O Lord God, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, Behold, you have given me no offspring, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, This one will not be your heir, but one who comes from your own body will be your heir. And the Lord took him outside and said, Now look to the heavens and count the stars if you are able. Then he told him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The Lord also told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of uh, Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abram replied, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? And the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him, split each of them down their middle and laid the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half, and the birds of prey descended on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and suddenly great terror and darkness overwhelmed him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 100, 400 years. But I will judge the nation they serve as slaves and afterward they will depart with many possessions. You, however, will go to your father in peace, fathers in peace, and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the halves of the carcasses. Hmm. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. What do you know? We got a rabbit trail. We got a segment, guys. This is time for our theological rabbit trail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. So there is something interesting in here before we summarize this chapter um, that I think it's important to point out because a lot of confusion comes from this chapter. There is. Wes, was Abraham supposed to cut those sacrificial animals in halves? Was he supposed to? Right. I, I didn't that see that he was specifically commanded to in these passages. Yeah. So if we check a, check here, it says... Verse 10, Abram brought all these to him, split each of them down the middle, and laid the halves opposite each other. Yeah. So that's the way it's worded to us. Right. In that passage is that he split them down the middle and laid the halves opposite each other. So just like we always try to teach everybody through finding context, one of the ways that you find context is you search for translator insertions. So according to Torah... This is not how you present a sacrifice. Right. 
So let's look at Jubilees 14, 9 through 11, the parallel accounts to this moment here in Genesis 15. In verse 9, he said unto him, Take me a heifer of these three years, and a goat of three years, and a sheep of three years, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And he took all these in the middle of the month, and he dwelt at the Oak of Mamre, which he which is near Hebron. By the way, this is the middle of the third month, so this is Shavuot. <laughs> and he built there an altar and sacrificed all these, and he poured their blood upon the altar and divided them in the midst and laid them over against each other. But the birds he divided not. He divided he not. Okay. So people would think, well, see, it says right there, he divided them in the midst, divided them yeah. in the midst. Right? Is that is that what that means though? Does that mean cut that them doesn't, in half? That doesn't have to mean that just based on no, what you believe. Is there. So let's look at the KJV of Genesis 15, 10, where where we're going to look at different translations about instead of them being split in half from the translation that I read, and this is the original KJV, it says he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, and he laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now this is more synonymous with the Jubilees account. It is. Right, yeah, the wording. So then, if we go to Genesis 10, 15, 10 from the Aramaic Bible in plain English, it says he took to him all of these and divided them equally and laid the members against its counterpart, and he did not divide the birds. That still may give someone the impression. So wait, does that mean he divided them equally? So therefore, oh, he must have cut them in half. I could see how they can draw that conclusion, but that's only if you don't know Torah. This is Torah portions, guys. We're going to learn Torah. Genesis 15, 10 in the Septuagint, it says, so he took to him all these. He divided them in the midst. Oh, there's that, that synonymous phraseology from the Greek translated Jubilees as well as the KJV. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he divided them in the midst. Let's look at what a person is supposed to do for a burnt offering when it comes to livestock in Leviticus 1, 10 through 13. If, however, one's offering is a burnt offering from the flock or from the sheep or from the goats, he's to present an unblemished male. He shall slaughter it on the north side of the altar before the Lord and Aaron's sons, the priests, are to sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. He is to cut the animal into pieces, and the priest shall arrange them. You, got, you remember uh, the utensils they used to put the actual pieces that they had they had cut up and filleted and mm -hmm. trimmed to the fat and taken the hide off? They put them on the actual altar with the little utensils they had. Yeah. That was instructed in Exodus. That's why. That okay. helped them reach over. Have you ever worked on a, a grill so big that you don't want to reach over the fire? You need a long stick to put the meat right. out there in the center of the grill. That's yeah. all this is. Okay. So this is a part of the priestly duty for them to actually set up like the literal practical detail of them having a huge cooking surface and not wanting to burn their clothes. So they had to have actual utensils to take these the sacrificial meat and place it and arrange it evenly throughout the altar so that it all cooks. If anyone's ever had a huge grill and cooked for 20 people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Where you have to arrange the pieces equally so that, but there's already an instruction for them to be cut in a proper way according to the priesthood, according to the requirements for the sacrifice. You don't split them in half. You don't put something that looks like a huge saw just went down the middle of an animal when it's like half bone and half skin and half sinews and half, you know, that's right. not how the instructions for Torah tells you to prepare the animal to put it on the altar. So verse 12, the priest is to cut the animal into pieces and the priest shall arrange them, including the head and the fat atop the burning wood that's on the altar. The entrails, the legs must be washed with water, and the priest shall bring all of it and burn it on the altar. It's a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It goes on to say, if instead one's offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, remember Abraham used both livestock and birds, he is to bring in a turtle dove or a young pigeon, just what Jubilees tells us, then the priest shall bring it to the altar, twist off its head, and burn it on the altar, and its blood should be drained out on the side of the altar. He is to remove the crop from its contents and throw it to the east side of the altar in the place for ashes. He shall tear it open by its wings without dividing the bird completely. That's you guys ever said there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Abraham didn't divide the birds, right? So because you guys ever filleted something, but you didn't actually tear it apart in two pieces, right? You butterflied it. That's all okay. it's done. Right? Ah, okay. Gotcha. That's all. It's, that's all it's saying. Like what the, is the, the animal. What's the crop of a bird? Um, the thing where they keep stuff in the below their neck. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, and the priest is to burn atop the altar with the the burning wood to burn offering offering made by fire, pleasing aroma to the Lord. So the point is, guys, you don't slice up the birds. Um, you take off their head, yes, but their bodies you don't cut into multiple pieces and arrange it on the altar. You keep them all. You keep the the bodies together. 
Uh, you can break their wings, but you keep the bodies together because what, what are you, why are you breaking their wings? So that you can flay it out and lay it flat. This mm-hmm. is why you butterfly something. But the animals, you don't, um, you don't cut them in half. You cut them up properly as instructed in the Torah, and then you arrange those pieces on the altar. That is how you divide it in its midst. Got it. So the reason why I say that is because it is not... Judaism has taken this Genesis 15 moment and they've created an entirely separate practice that is not detailed for the priests in Torah, and they call it a threshold covenant. They claim that Abraham in Genesis 15 took this sacrifice, cut open these these animals, and filleted them open on two sides and walked through the bloody canal in between them as a death pact with Yahweh to say that this is a what's called a threshold covenant, meaning that I'm going to walk between these birds or between these animals that have been filleted in half, and if I break the, the rules of this covenant, you can kill me. It makes sense that Judaism would do that since they reject the priesthood. They then reject the practices See. of the priests. So then right. they would have to reinterpret, you know, what's going on there. And then also, re- not, go ahead, you, you first. I was say they reject Jubilees. So they reject the yeah, idea there's an actual it. altar there. Right. And they promote a concept of Yahweh coming to be their savior. So therefore, which is where Trinitarian, Trinitarianism grabbed this idea to say that, oh, he had to die for you to save you. Mm-hmm. Whereas Judaism would say, well, no, Yahweh is the only savior, not the son. So therefore he had to save it because he made this pact with Abraham. And since Abraham broke it, he had to come save Abraham. From, see what I mean? So yeah. they, they twist all this and ignore the priesthood and all the details for it because they take this part of the translation without looking at the supplementary passages. So yeah, lots here. Lots here. It is. There is. Also in my studies, I found it interesting that it's something prevalent in Freemasonry that they have a threshold covenant and threshold mm-hmm. superstitions. Yep. It makes you wonder if it didn't come from there, from this oh, Kabbalah mystery religion. Absolutely, brother. Yeah, it's all the same. It's all the same. Um, so, yes, thank you guys for letting us engage on that theological rabbit trail. <laughs> Good times. Yeah. So that's a, to me, that's a huge thing. I mean, I could probably do an entire video on that, but that's kind of like a huge piece of misunderstanding that I've seen for many years pertaining to Genesis 15. They don't understand that Abraham is a priest. He's doing priestly duties, priestly details according to Torah. He has an altar according to Jubilees 15. He's not throwing things on the ground. This is him doing it right. Yeah. This is the righteous way. The righteous way. So I got summarized here in Genesis 15. Yahweh sends an angel to Abraham to to assure him he will have a child. Many descendants will come from that and forever possess the land in which he is currently sojourning. I love what you read there where he asks, you know, how how will I know I I will possess it, Yahweh? And Yahweh's like, set up an altar. I'm going to give you, I'm about to give you a vision. (laughs) So look, what we just explained with the threshold covenant. And when he woke up from the vision, he sees the smoke and the fire passing through the pieces. Guys, that's passing through the pieces on the altar. This is, this is nothing new for Yahweh. This is not some special occasion. This is the same thing we see in Leviticus 8 when the, the uh, glory of Yahweh from the angel of the presence is there, lights the fire of the sacrifice. This is the same thing we see in 1 Kings chapter 8. The glory of Yahweh from the angel of the presence that descends into the new temple that Solomon built and lights the sacrifice. This is the same thing we see in Judges mm-hmm. chapter 6 with, you know, with Gideon where he touches the altar with his stick and lights the fire of the sacrifice. Yeah. Like it's, this is there's multiple examples of first Kings 19 or 18 with Elijah Mount Carno, Carmel. God from heaven sends fire down and lights the, the sacrifice because so, you don't want strange fire. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is the father is Abraham has a vision and this is where he goes into the, to the you know, the dark moment of terror. That's it's horrible wording, in my opinion. They should just say he's having a vision. It's yeah. Like a darkness and a terror came upon him. <laughs> I, I don't really understand why the why they use that terminology, but um. Clearly, he just, this is a moment, just like all the other appointed times. Guys, this is happening on Shavuot. How many times does an angel show up in, in, in these occasions on Shavuot? That's a whole nother study that we could do. You Pentecost, know? right? Acts 2, nothing yes. new. Yeah. And this, so this is a wonderful moment where the, at this moment of renewing the covenant, Abraham is asking the father, how will I know that what you're promising me is truly going to happen? And the father's like, cool. Do the Shavuot sacrifice that's required. I'm about to give you a vision. I'm going to show you the future. What does he see in the future? 
quest created well, the, the box of Abraham. Ah, uh, okay, the kingdom, right? Yeah, he's the he's kingdom. The kingdom and the saints resurrected into it, and mm-hmm. all that comes with that. Yeah, which is the land he's promised to inherit. He's going to see Yeshua as well. He's going to see, you know, that which is the day of Yeshua that he gets to see the promise fulfilled. So, like the Father, this is such a huge moment that I feel like Judaism is stole from us from understanding Abraham's intimate connection with the Father and how the Father affirmed what he promised him. Yes. Yes, Abraham believed and it was credit to his righteousness. We're going to cover that in, here in a minute. But the Father doesn't ask you to believe blindly. He shows his prophets. And in Genesis 5, Genesis chapter 20, Abraham is called a prophet specifically. He shows his prophets visions of the future to affirm the covenant promises all throughout Scripture. So, you know, this is to me, this is just another example of that that's kind of been shaded over because of the wording as it's passed down to us. And I just hope to bring a little bit of clarity with that. So cool. You did. That helped me. Yeah. Oh, have you, have you wondered about that? Well, I've seen you talk about it in other videos, but something clicked for me today to help me understand it better. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful moment, especially when you add in Jubilees and the Apocalypse of Abraham and you just kind of get that more well-rounded idea, you know, Um, but Torah, even if you didn't have Jubilees and and the Apocalypse of Abraham, Torah, as listed from Exodus through Deuteronomy should also help you interpret Genesis 15 and what Abraham's doing and why he's being promised this. And so, yeah, it's just, it just requires a little bit more advanced application of knowing Torah, whereas Jubilees and Apocalypse of Abraham just flat out tell you what's happening, you know? So yeah, context yeah. creates comprehension. You can't defend truth without knowing the word. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. All right. I'm going to, unless there's anything else, I'll jump to 16. That'll do it. It's your turn, All right, right, brother? Oh, actually, we have a quick moment here. I just I want the audience to chime in. There is some there's some chat in the live chat, but if you're watching this later and you want to comment, uh, please put your comment down below after you hit that thumbs up, smash that, so we can help get the algorithms get the truth out to more people. But more than anything, did you know that what we just talked about was actually an altar sacrifice performed by Abraham? Big shout out to our brother, Ken Heidebright from hanging on his words, supplying that track. Go check out his latest, uh, his latest album on his, on his channel, hanging on his words. Oh, you're on mute, brother. Oh, fallen man. Great album. It's a great, great album. Yeah. Yeah. I would give it a dove award if I had the power. All right, guys. Genesis 16, one through four. Now Abram's wife, Sarah had born him, no children, but she had an Egyptian. Ma- oh, I'm sorry. Uh, was it my turn to read, Wes, or was this yours? It's yours. Go okay, ahead. my bad. All right. I got so excited with our rabbit trail, I forgot. <laughs> Verse 1. Now Abram's wife, Sarah, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Look now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go to my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after he had lived in Canaan for 10 years, his wife, Sarai, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, gave her to Abram to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When Hagar realized that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong done to me be upon you. I delivered my servant into your arms. And ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she treated me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. Here, said Abram, your servant is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she fled from her. Now, the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the desert, the spring along the road to Shur. Hagar, servant of Sarai, he said, Where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she replied. So the angel of the Lord told her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then the angel added, I will greatly multiply your offspring so that they will too be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord proceeded, Behold, you have conceived and will bear a son, and you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So Hagar gave this name to the Lord, who had spoken to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, Here I have seen the one who sees me. Therefore the well was called Bier Leho Roy. 
It is located between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. All right, there's a lot going on here. What sure. are your thoughts, brother? I'd, I'd be interested to hear yours. I don't have many just yet. An angel appeared. Well, That's right. I've, it's always an awkward situation when a woman is in despair and she's, you know, thinking that the promise to her is the time has run out on that, right? She thinks she's too old to conceive and bear children. She thinks she's missed her window. Her biological clock is keeping her up at night, pounding inside of her head. And here comes, you know, she has the maidservant with her. And it, this actually was a thing back in those days was that they would be like, all right, well, you can have more children by taking on a second wife. Now, even though this is not instructed in Torah, it's not, it's not, it's not said you can't do it basically. So this is another situation where Abraham didn't want to choose multiple women to marry. He just married Sarah and he was happy. Apparently she was a hottie. What would you say to somebody that looked but, at that and said, that sounds like adultery. I thought we were commanded to not cheat on our spouses, have sexual relations with somebody else. The wife allowed this. Okay. So by custom, it's not, it's not prohibited. There's no law against this in the Torah about taking on a multiple wives. In fact, there is a law for um, a, 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 there is a clause I should say within the Torah that says why you could take on a second wife if you know your brother's widow had not conceived and you want to carry on that family line for your brother so there's actual a legitimate um co community reason why the father would allow for multiple wives to one man um obviously we have in deuteronomy 17 yahweh telling the kings of israel not to have more than one wife mm -hmm. and we see some of the most of the righteous men in, in scripture do not have more than one wife unless they were tricked like jacob or with this situation you know, he's listening to his wife because she's she's giving into the fear that the father's promises are not going to come true. So it's not adultery because his wife is fully aware of it. And they, she, it says, you know, he gave she gave Hagar to him to be his wife, not just to have a one night fling with. Got it. So therefore, he now has two wives. Yeah. So this is why we're going to see later when he has to put her away. Um that it, it weighs on him so much and that Jubilees chapter, I think it's chapter 17 talks about how this was one of the tests that Abraham went through was that it was, it was difficult for him to put away his, his son, his only son at the time. And this maidservant who had become his wife. So it was tough for him to do. And that's why the angel has to show up and say to Abraham, no, it's, it's okay. Let her go. Listen to the wife, listen to your yeah. wife's uh, counsel in this regard. Um, because you know, you're going to have another son, you're going to have Isaac, you know, so there, you know, this is, this becomes an issue, an emotional issue for both Abraham and Sarah. And of course, Hagar, obviously being this whole concept. But um, I just think that's interesting that, you know, you can have two wives. It's, I would never, I would never encourage that. We here at Kingdom of Context don't encourage that. Uh, but there is a, there isn't a, an, a clause, I should say in the Torah that is acceptable under certain reasons. And in this, in this case, it seems like Sarah is in fear and Abraham gives into her request thinking that they're going to have the child of promise through Hagar. So It does appear that every time it's done the right way and in righteousness that there are extenuating circumstances from what I can tell. Yes. And yeah, y'all yeah, have done several milk and meat live streams on this kind of subject and topic. I'd recommend anybody go check those out too. Polygamy and whatnot. Yeah. I do love the father's grace and like this, just his love towards Hagar, where even though she feels put out and she feels mistreated, I mean, she's, um, she's pregnant at the time. You know how, you know, that's a, that's a big toll on a woman's body. Um, they have lots of strange emotions go through them when they're pregnant that, that are not normal because of the fluctuation and all kinds of chemicals happening in their body as their body's growing another human inside them. Yeah. So she, while she's pregnant, Sarah treats her harshly and she runs away. But the angel comes up and tells to, to Hagar, you know, go back to Sarah and Abraham and submit to their authority. I think that's powerful. It doesn't appear that uh, Sarai treated her harshly, like just for no reason, because doesn't it say you said you have there in the summary, it says that Hagar started to despise Sarai. So she had a bad reaction to her disposition That's with right. her well you know it was like 
culturally, it was like a, a point of shame if a woman couldn't have a, a child and the other women would look down upon those women who couldn't conceive. And so they didn't know if it was Abraham that was sterile or if it was Sarah that had the problem until Hagar gets pregnant. Right. And then she realized, oh, it must be Sarah. Sarah is the one who can't conceive. So then culturally, it's a temptation for Hagar to look at Sarah and go, yeah, you're not you're not a woman. You know, you're and, and that's your wife. That was a horrible yeah. attitude. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, because now she definitely has an inheritance promised to her through this great wealth of Abraham. She definitely mm -hmm. is in on that will and, and the alimony, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the provision that would go with her being a wife to this, this great man who's very wealthy and very prominent and people respect him um, as well as now having his child. So like, it's, yeah. you know, this is like classic, TV daytime drama stuff. And so it really is. just goes to show it's yeah, not without it's not without uh, troubles and, and tribulation to take on this kind of responsibility and expand your family in this yeah. way. You know, more wives, more problems in this regard. That's right. Yeah, we don't want we don't want multiple wives, guys. Just stick to one. That's what we encourage you. The father created Adam and Eve, and that was that was good. That's what he called good, right? He didn't create Adam a bunch of wives, just one wife. So. In this messed up circumstance, now you have Ishmael in the mix, and the father still promising Ishmael, look, I'm going to make a great thing. Guys, if y'all are interested, go check out the book of Jubilees. It actually shows you in chapter 21 and 22. Ishmael was coming back for Shavuot and for different feast days for Sukkot to celebrate with Abraham. He did have a relationship with Abraham. Abraham taught Ishmael righteousness. It says that Ishmael walked in righteousness and taught his descendants righteousness, which is the ways of Yahweh. So there's the, unfortunately, Genesis doesn't give us the rest of the story. Jubilees does. Hagar and Ishmael are taken care of by the father. Let the let the angel showing up to Hagar to encourage her in this moment be a, a indication to you that the father cares greatly about them. And Hagar, or at least Ishmael, did practice the ways of Yahweh as he was taught them by Abraham throughout his life. How did did he had weekend visits? Did he come visit every month? I don't know the details on that. But as a grown man, it says that Ishmael was coming back and celebrating the feasts with Abraham and doing righteousness. So. He is um, there is there is solidarity there and he comes with Isaac. So he has a relationship with Isaac, too. So just be encouraged, guys. I like that. Hagar called Yahweh Elroy. It's a, it's a <laughs> right. name you don't hear very funny? often. Right. But it, it means the God who sees me. Right. Elroy Jetson is the only yeah. Elroy that I've, I know of. <laughs> wasn't there a um, wasn't there Roy D. Roy D. Mercer? That's not Elroy. That's just Roy D. Mercer. How big a boy are you? <laughs> anyway, you? You may not, you may, you may not know that joke. People in the oh, audience no. know that joke. My wife knows it. She's, she's probably okay. laughing. Um, Sounds familiar. It's anyway. Yeah, you have to go check out this comedian Roy D. Mercer. He, he does prank calls on people. Tries to fight people over the phone. It's funny. Um, so yeah, Elroy apparently means the god who sees me. That's pretty interesting. If you ever want to name your kid Elroy, but um, I won't be doing that. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, do you want 17? I will take it. Yes, sir. All right, brother. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will descend from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And to you and your descendants, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan as an eternal possession. And I will be their God. Eternal possession. God also said to Abraham, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants and the generations after you. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, which you are to keep. Every male among you must be circumcised. You are to circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and this will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Generation after generation, every male must be circumcised when he is eight days old, including those born in your household and those purchased from a foreigner, even those who are not your offspring. Whether they are born in your household or purchased, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh will be an everlasting covenant 
But if any male is not circumcised, he will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your, your wife, do not call her Sarai, for her name is to be Sarah. And I will bless her and I will and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will descend from her. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah give birth at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live under your blessing. But God replied, your wife, Sarah, will indeed bear you a son and you are to name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you and I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He will become the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or purchased with his money, every male among the members of Abraham's household, and he circumcised them just as God had told him. So Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his Ishmael and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised on the same day and all the men of Abraham's household, both servants born in his household and those purchased from foreigners were circumcised with him. So servants, good stuff. Yeah, there's this a lot here, man. Big chapter. I love how you, you caught chapter or verse eight's little inclusion of that word eternal. Yeah, it's everlasting and eternal. We, we saw that several times, right? I'm mm -hmm. just reminded, if I could, of where we see that in Galatians 3.29, because yes, we have read Galatians and it says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. And it just says that there's an everlasting covenant with Abraham and all of his descendants. Mm -hmm. So then if we belong to Christ, we're a part of that covenant. That's right. Okay. It's amazing. So it that does. means I get that eternal possession as well. Yes. This just as, as uh, uh, Paul also refers to us being co-heirs in Romans, right? Mm -hmm. We're, we're co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs of what? We will. An heir is someone who inherits. What do you inherit? Not only eternal life like Christ did, but also Christ inherits the land of promise in the same covenant of Abraham, just like you and I are promised. So I love it. Yeah, That's correct. Beautiful. And it is an eternal possession, guys. This is why it's such a big deal. And Abraham is like saying, hey, you know, like, are you sure? I'm going to, how will I know I'll possess this? Are you sure? Like, it's an eternal promise. That's a big promise for an angel to show up to a man and say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to give you this land forever. It is. Meanwhile. There's all these other people living in the land. Meanwhile, there's giants there that you don't, you can't overcome that are populating and doing wickedness. And you're like, do I want this particular piece of land? You know, like, so I think it's fascinating in Genesis 15, he tells him, you know, I'm going to give you the land between the Euphrates and the Nile. So, and this will be an eternal possession, eternal possession. Well, Abraham lived the rest of his life and dies at 176. Did he inherit it eternally? This is what I've asked since I started my channel. No, but Hebrews tells us what was going through Abraham's mind. He knew that that eternal possession required resurrection. So Correct. this is the promise. He knew that Yahweh was the God of resurrection, the God of the living who would right. resurrect to those in faith. And this is of course in the writings of Enoch everywhere, by the way. So if Jubilees 12 is correct and, and Abraham had the books of Enoch passed down to him from Noah and Shem, then of course he already knew the promise of the covenant, the promise of the resurrection, and it was a great starting place of faith for him to hear this reaffirm, reaffirmed covenant to him, as I have on screen here, and know that, okay, so I'm in the same promise that was also given all the way to Shem, Noah, Methuselah, Enoch, all those guys, Jared, you know, all those guys, Kenan, all the way back to Adam. So, and this, of course, you know, if we, if you cross reference some of this and you go to read Jubilees 20, um, he mentions this blessing of the promise of the covenant extending all the way back to Adam and that he wants that for Isaac and Jacob as well. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Me too. Yeah. We see in Hebrews as well, when it's talking about how, you know, Abraham, it starts with Abraham and it lists off the whole hall of faith. 
And then it goes on to say that he died, that it says all of these died without receiving the promises of the covenant and that apart That's from right. us, they would not be made perfect. And this was written, what, 20, 30 years at least after there in Hebrews, after Christ's death and resurrection, just goes to show that none of those apostles and, and you know, disciples afterwards thought that when Yeshua resurrected, he took all of the, the patriarchs out of Sheol with him up to heaven. Right. Yeah, they knew better, right? They knew they knew the actual story that was promised to everybody that came before them. And so they knew that it required resurrection on a singular day of all the saints and that the land of promise would have to come back to the earth because it's been withdrawn from the earth. So, right. yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful promise of the kingdom built right into Genesis 17. And it's here. Like I always talk about, guys, the gospel of the kingdom is in every book of the of the of the Bible. And of multiple Bibles and different canons around the world. And so it's also here in Genesis abundantly as we go through the covenant promised Abraham. So just real quick as a, as a basic summary of this chapter, for those studying at home, Yahweh sent an angel to Abraham when he was 90 years old and he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Yahweh reaffirmed the covenant and its promises and requirements to Abraham, right? So this is him making sure he understood the commandments were to be followed the promise, if you do this in faith, is that you'll get eternal life at the resurrection. You'll get the land of promise that I'm going to give you. Yahweh introduced the eternal instructions of circumcision to Abraham as a part of the covenant requirements. So what, what are your thoughts on this one real quick, Wes? He, he offered circumcision. Abraham did it. Everyone in his household, all the men, he did it when he was told to. And do you think this is the first time man circumcised anyone on the earth? I'd have to say it's probably not the first time. No, it's just the, the first time it's introduced to us in the, you know, modern American canon, Protestant canon of scripture. Um, it's really reminiscent of Jubilees 15. You know, all the talking about how if they if they don't, uh, if you don't circumcise the flesh of your sons on the eighth day, on the, on the eighth day, then you're, uh, you're, you've broken my covenant and you're to be cut off. Well, so it just, that kind of proposes a bit of a challenge with, uh, what we see later on, you know, in the in the epistles where we have the circumcision party talking with Paul and that opens up a whole nother can of worms. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were trying to say that you're you're cut off from covenant if you're not circumcised. Well, Abraham was a perfect example of having been in covenant with the father even before he kind of gives them some of these instructions uh -huh. and that he doesn't get circumcised. until he's ninety nine. He started following him when he was what? How old? Like. 14 according 14 to Jubilees. Old. That's right. Yeah. And he he came to faith in Babylon, then went to Haran, then moved down into Canaan, where once he got down into Canaan, there were already people following the Most High God. Do you think they were already circumcised? It's possible. Was Adam circumcised when he went, was taken to the garden after purification days? I think you'd have to be to be able to be in the garden. What about Enoch when Julie says that Enoch was taken into the garden for 300 years to be a scribe and write down the condemnation of mankind leading up to the flood? Was he circumcised to be in the father's house? Just as I mean, does the father doesn't change? This is I'm kind of being rhetorical. I think Wes knows this, yeah. but the father doesn't change, guys. He tells us in his covenant that these things are eternal, just like he tells in Genesis 17 to Abraham that this is an eternal instruction. And Jubilees chapter 15, 27, which is what uh, uh, Wes already mentioned, it says that the angels in heaven were created from their first day of creation. They were already circumcised because they're ministers in the temple in heaven. They're a part of a priesthood in heaven. You cannot be in, go into the Father's temple and stand before him to have a sacrificial fellowship meal and not be circumcised as a male. And so, therefore, this is an eternal instruction from the Creator to all male members of, of various kinds, mankind and, and angel kind. But this is an eternal instruction of his Torah. So we see this in Ezekiel 44, 7 through 9, where he's chastising the corrupt priesthood in Ezekiel's day who were allowing priests to come into the temple and minister who had not been circumcised. And then he promises in his house in the future, there will not be anyone that's not circumcised both in flesh and in the heart that comes into his temple. Um, this is... So I think it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. What I see in this, this is why I mentioned this earlier, I think in chapter 14, when we got to the Melchizedek, Wes, is that I see Abraham is raised in Chaldea and then in Haran with his family. Remember, his father was, was a general to Nimrod, 
Mm-hmm. So this is not like he didn't come up in a, and he, it tells us in Jubilees uh, 12 that his father told him, look, I know this idolatry thing is worthless, but if I don't do this, the people will kill me. So like even his father knew and was an idol maker and a general to Nimrod and was a very prominent leader in that society. So for them to leave and go to Haran, um, kind of a big deal. And he's ra- Abraham is raised in this guys. He's, he's kind of like, how do I put this? He's th- meanwhile. So think about a map if you could, right? So you got Abraham, he's raised over here around, around the Euphrates, Mesopotamian Chaldea area. Meanwhile, down here in the Levants near Bethel, there is already people also from the line of Shem from different descendants practicing the ways taught to them by Shem passed down through Peleg and Ru and all those other guys uh, to Eber to get us to the place where they know the ways of Yahweh and keep carrying it on even with their own priesthood. I promise you they're circumcised, guys. Yahweh's laws do not change. I promise you they've already taught circum. Abraham is being brought along in discipleship according to how the father thinks he needs to be in the pace that he needs to be. So at this point in Abraham's life, Yahweh's like, all right, I can introduce circumcision to him now. He was, yep. If he'd have been raised under Shem's descendants through Eber, he probably would have already been done as a baby. But he wasn't. He was raised in Babylon. So just like with, with Gershom and Moses' son, Gershom was was being raised in Midian through being born through Zipporah outside of Egypt in you know in the land of Midian, and they weren't following circumcision practices. So, but Moses had been circumcised, and he knew that was an eternal sign of the covenant, and he and he had to deal with the threat of being killed because he hadn't circumcised Gershom, and Gershom at that point was already thirty years old. So this was a situation where the father, he, you know, he's not going to just immediately kill you if you don't do it. Clearly. Abraham was in covenant with the father for what is that 80, 84 years, 85 years without being or 75 years without being circumcised. And then he does it right. And Yahweh's Yahweh doesn't give him any special extra benefit at that point. He's just saying, this is part of my internal instructions. And now it's time for you to do this part as well. So therefore, just like with Moses and Gershom, Moses had had lacked in this area and he needed to have done this requirement or this instruction. He didn't. And then before he went back to Egypt to lead the people, he needed to be a proper example. So he needed to to circumcise Gershom. So this was, you know, it's just these types of things to me is like, it's a beautiful example that the father doesn't expect you to do it all right. Like as a child or the moment that you come into the faith. In fact, that being said, would you then say that there will be people that will make it into the kingdom that were never circumcised in their mortal oh, flesh? 100%, because at the resurrection, they get circumcised. That's right. Okay, good. So that's what I was going to get into is just because a moment ago, you alluded to that passage in, in Isaiah, I believe it is, where it says that nobody Ezekiel. uncircumcised, the Ezekiel, thank you, nobody uncircumcised will enter into the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, heaven, right? And so people would would have a, a knee-jerk reaction to that if we don't clarify, I think, just because, as we mentioned, that Jubilees 15 does say, and the for all the angels of the presence and all the angels of sanctification have been so created from the day of their creation in the context of circumcision, and that in the resurrection, Yeshua says, we will be made like the angels. So even if somebody weren't, weren't to have the flesh of their foreskin circumcised in this mortal life, but they are judged righteously still at the resurrection, then uh, they will... They will receive a new body already taken care of for them. Yeah, First Corinthians 15, Paul cr- promises you you're going to get an incorruptible body. That means your body's made new, it's incorruptible. And a part of that, having a perfected body, is having a circumcised body. I Dare I say it. So this is the promise. At the resurrection, you'll be made like the angels. You will be circumcised so that you can enter the Father's house and have a fellowship meal with him, and there'll be no issue. So this is, it's, it's beautiful. Um, real quick, finish out this chapter. We think, I think we got three more chapters to hit. And uh, basically Yahweh changes Sarai's name to Sarah, which is interesting. A lot of people have done a Hebrew breakdown on adding the H to Abraham and Sarai. So it's interesting. Also Yahweh promised Abraham and Sarah, they would have a son named Isaac who would continue in Abraham's authority. That is his seed. That's why when you see this reference to this word seed, when it's speaking about Noah's seed, Shem's seed, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's seed, it's the people that are doing covenant behavior, the commandments, and specifically when it comes to Abraham's authority, his name, his seed is perpetuated on the earth, as both Genesis and Jubilees explain. That means someone that's going to carry on the priesthood for him. So we have a direct promise from the angel in Genesis 17 to Abraham and Sarah. Isaac will pick up your place in the priesthood, your authority, just as we read at the very beginning in Genesis 12, verse 2. 
Yahweh says to Abraham, I will make your name great. I will make your authority great. So this is where he's going to pass on that authority to Isaac. Abraham circumcised, circumcised himself and all the men of his household. That includes Ishmael, who I believe at this point was 14 years old. So all those men, what kind of conversation do you think that was? Uh, when <laughs> All those 318 warriors that he had in his house. He wants us and, to uh, do what? So wait, he's wanting us to do what? Or is it possible that they already kind of knew that there were people that had been circumcised on the earth because they were already interacting with those priests of the Melchizedek order, right? Earlier after the war uh, between the, the the kings, right? So it's like just, you, you know, were, like you were saying uh, earlier, he doesn't make anybody do anything in blind faith. So it's, it's very possible that he had examples and influence around for them to see, okay, we're not the only ones, I guess. And it yeah. wasn't as the poor moment where she, you know, thou art a bloody husband to me. <laughs> <laughs> throwing foreskins at each other and being mad about it. No, they were doing this in obedience because they were they were worshiping. All of these guys are being following the example of Abraham to do the commandments of God and to love the Lord their God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind, guys. These people are doing this uh, in, in a wonderful way. This is a this is a this what we would consider a righteous clan of Abraham, right? If I could put on my Scottish voice. It, this These guys were like, you know, they were doing it right. You know, their tartan was righteousness, you know, these people were trying to do the ways of Yahweh and they were being commended and blessed financially, spiritually protected from all their enemies around them. It's not a thing to take a quick snip as a man. I mean, and Abraham you know, must have been blessed with steady hands. Steady yeah, the, surgeon, the surgeon's household. hands. Yeah. <laughs> surgeon's hands. So, guys, if you have not heard before the idea that we've explained to you from Jubilees that um, that Wes and I expounded upon that you're promised that the resurrection be made like the angels and the angels are told to us to have been circumcised since the first day they were made. Go ahead and drop that in the comments. Let us know that you never heard that before. We'd love to hear from you. All right. You want who read last? I think I read last. So pretty okay. Sure. I'll take Go Luke ahead. one here. Luke one. This is going to be part of our companion passages, guys. Luke one, one through five. Many have undertaken to compose an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by the initial eyewitnesses and servants of the world. Therefore, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent Theophilus. So that is that where Bill and Ted got it? Most excellent. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, whose wife Elizabeth was a daughter of Aaron. You know, one of Morgan and I's favorites is uh, goodliest. We love when the Bible says goodliest. Is goodliest, yeah. <laughs> That's great. The old English man. It's great. Mm -hmm. Verse six, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and decrees of the Lord. That's amazing, guys. Just just take note of that. People that walk in the commandments and the decrees of the Lord are considered righteous. We're going to have to talk about that a little bit when we get to Romans four. Verse seven, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. One day while Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And at the hour of the incense offering, the whole congregation was praying outside. Just then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you. Many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall never take wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Many of the sons of Israel, he will turn back to the Lord their God. Keep keep note, guys, as we read this. John the Baptist is also being referred to as someone that will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he's being described as someone that's keeping the commandments faithfully and teaching repentance. Just as Abraham did. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. How can I be sure of this? Zechariah asked the angel. 
I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. I am Gabriel, replied the angel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you, to bring, to bring you this good news. And you will be silent and unable to speak until the day this comes to pass, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why it took so long in the temple. When he came out and was unable to speak to them, they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. He kept making signs to them, but remained speechless. And when the days of his service were complete, he returned home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. She declared, The Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown me favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel appeared to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. Excuse me, he said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Wes, does that say his kingdom will be Tartaria and will go away? after mm, no years. it doesn't no, it say doesn't. it's metaphorical and it doesn't say it's a lot of things that people try to make it out to be <laughs> verse 34 how can this be mary asked the angel since i'm a virgin the angel replied the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you so the holy one to be born will be called the son of god look even elizabeth your relative has conceived a son in her old age and she who was called barren is in her sixth month for no word from god will ever fail i am the lord's servant Mary answered, May it happen to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. And in those days, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered the home of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord's word to her will be fulfilled. Then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has humbled the humble. Excuse me, but has exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful, as he promised to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. When the time came for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, when they came to circumcise the child, they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother replied, No, his, he shall be called John. So they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who bears this name. So they made signs to his father to find out what he wanted to name the child. Zechariah asked for a tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they were all amazed. Immediately, Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue was released, and he began to speak, praising God. All their neighbors were filled with awe, and people throughout the hill country of Judea were talking about these events. All who heard this wondered in their hearts and asked, What then will this child become? For the Lord's hand was with him. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through his holy prophets, those, age, those of ages past, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to grant us deliverance from hostile hands, that we may serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. And you, child, you will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of their tender mercy, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the dawn will visit us from on high to shine on those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until the time of his public appearance to Israel. 
so much gold lots to unpack here but apparently it's not an uncommon thing for the father to grant women in their old age or couples in their old age to to have children still yeah even after it seems physically impossible yeah there's quite a few parallels here with abraham and sarah's life and uh not just with uh you know conceiving an old age like elizabeth did but also um tying that intimately to the, the coming of the messiah to the promise of the covenant given to abraham I got it. I like it. Yeah, I like yeah. that it was called uh that they said a couple times that he will prepare the way for the Lord, yeah. right? Basically. And so yeah, we see that basically fulfilled, right? In Matthew three, repent for the kingdom is at hand. This is John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We That's talked right. a little bit about that passage on uh on Common Ground, episode 24, that kingdom come as well. Yeah. What else is here? Go ahead. And he will, John the Baptist, of course, part of preparing them for that was calling them to repentance, getting them back to righteousness and wisdom, which is what Malachi 4, 5, and 6 talks about, right? That he will send someone, the spirit of Elijah, who will come and, you know, turn the hearts of the fathers, you know, sons back to their fathers and fathers back to their sons. And the whole concept of leading people into a righteous behavior and attitude towards each other. So he's prepping them, right? This is all groundwork so that when Yeshua comes through, they receive the message with joy. So he's 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 plowing up the stony ground so Yeshua's seeds can be could be properly planted and, and well watered. So it's it's a beautiful combo combo, if you will, combo package. It is, it is. I also like that we got Gabriel showing up here, right? He is referred to as one of the holy angels who is set over paradise and the cherubim and the seraphim. And Enoch it talks about him, yes. and then, and then in verse it's Luke one verse eleven, he's identified as an angel of the Lord, but nobody should suggest that this is Yeshua, as we hear many people <laughs> do saying the angel of the Lord is Yeshua because he identifies himself as Gabriel. But that's I've right. even heard people say, "Yeah, that's just another name for Yeshua." I'm like, "Come on!" <laughs> You're like, "So wait, Yeshua shows up as an angel while he's cloned as a as a fetus in the womb of Mary." to announce his own conception and birth like what's going on here how about he it is who he says he is how about it's just gabriel like you talked about right he's already someone that's introduced in the scriptures first enoch chapter 70 says he's one of the holy angels who enters this amazing temple with the other six right mm -hmm. so he's one of the in my understanding he's one of the seven spirits who stand before the lord of hosts mm -hmm. in, seven in the holiest of revelation yeah, one, yeah the archangels like the top authority angels over all the other angels so this was a big deal for him to show up to mary mm -hmm. yeah, it really was i saw a beautiful depiction of that moment and i wish i remembered the name of it but there's a a uh a youtube series or a show that they put on youtube where that that scene was and the angel comes to mary and she's sitting outside like in a, a busy city section people walking people doing commerce and when the angel comes there's just silence it was great it looked really well they did it really That's well. Nice. I mean, mm -hmm. brother, if you ever, uh, the father ever leads you into making movies, uh, you would be an amazing director, in my opinion. Yeah, hey, I think thank you. Would be great. Yeah, I think he's given you that talent for sure. Um, I also got here, I know we got uh, two more chapters to cover. And I also got here in, you know, John the Baptist's parents are introduced as righteous and obeying the commandments of Yahweh faithfully. And I, I love this because there's a lot of teachers out there that think that you can't be called righteous if you obey, if you follow God, right? That, you, yet your your righteousness is as a filthy rag and that you can't actually do anything in the Old Testament properly. It's impossible somehow. It's an impossible standard that you can never fulfill. And that is not scriptural, guys. It's the not. Father doesn't give you a task that you can't complete. And we have John the Baptist's parents right here being called righteous because they obeyed faithfully the commandments of Yahweh. What say you, brother? Yeah, I'm reminded of First John. Apostle John goes on to say in 1 John 3, 7, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, capital H, is righteous. So that, that would dispel the notion, this idea that nothing we can do gives us any kind of righteousness. That there, We have no standard of right behavior is what that really amounts to for people to say that. <laughs> that nothing we can do is good. I'm like, what? <laughs> that's part of the enemies. That's part of the enemies kind of, um, you know, theology that they they've 
you know, impressed upon the world is that there is no um, difference between, you know, th th there is no ultimate absolute truth and that it, your truth is your truth and whatever you think is good is relative depending on who you're talking to. And I'm just like, no, guys, there's absolutes. There's absolutely always a bad something. It can always be bad. Some things can always be good. And the father outlines his instructions for how we're supposed to love each other and love him in detail yeah. for us. Because that's what a good teacher does. A good father does. He doesn't give you a standard you can never achieve to only to then condemn you for not achieving it. Right. So this is why, yes, of course, of course, if everyone's listening and they're knee jerking right now, of course, we're about to read Romans four. I'm wearing a shirt that says Yeshua. We just talked about the birth of our savior. Of course we understand he makes propitiation and atonement for us and that he's the one that actually secures our salvation for us. We just know what those words mean. Yes. And the only so reason he can... has to make propitiation for us is because of our transgressions. That's right. If... So we, we understand that John the Baptist, his parents were, practicing the ways of righteousness as outlined in the law of the prophets. Um, this is what we're told. It never says you have to get it perfectly. That's why they have the priesthood. In fact, we're reading about a guy here in our second bullet point. Zacharias, John the father, is a priest at the temple. That means he's making atonement as, as a part of his duties for the prayers of the saints and the, and the propitiation for the saints. Like This is what they did. This is all included. The whole assumption here, looking at John the Baptist's father, is that he's performing a part of the Torah where the father knew you would make a mistake and he put a man to mediate for your mistake on your behalf. That doesn't mean that you stop striving to not make mistakes. That doesn't mean you stop striving towards his behavior of righteousness because you made a mistake. No, that's, that's, that's wicked, wicked thinking that's passed on to us from dispensation theology. This is simply the father's call to, Hey, I've asked all of Israel in covenant with me to practice my behavior. And when you mess up, I've given you an entire order of priesthood. That is going to help make atonement for you so you can we're, we're all good you know it's called a fellowship meal the angel appears to zachariah while he's in this temple um going in for his part of the, his, his duty I, I little detail that it doesn't get explained to us in the in the book of numbers wes where it talks about the the different uh, divisions and how they would have like certain times like this particular one it says they just drew lots to see whose division was supposed to minister at which time yeah but then if you, later in the chapter it says that after zachariah's um time was finished and completed he went back home which meant that they stayed at the temple during their their time like on duty so to speak yeah right? but that's why the temple had these extra rooms where they could go change and they had sleeping quarters and like barracks if you will so i just i just wonder how long like they did was it a month was it a week you know was it two weeks i just i don't see that detailed for us in the book of numbers if anyone in the audience does you're welcome to to point that out if i've overlooked it but just little details like that I've always wondered because, uh, you know, like we've talked about in the past, we, there just seems to be a lot of things summarized in Exodus to Deuteronomy that I'm wondering the original generation had all these specific details. Makes you wonder for sure. I also like that, uh, you know, the name John is something you and I both have a connection to with my last name being Jones, your first name being Sean. Those are both derivatives of this name, Sha uh, John. And uh, in the Hebrew, it's Yahu Kanan, I believe. And uh, I've looked it up. It just means that blessed and favored by Yahweh. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Amen. Um, what else do we notice? I just love Mary's Mary's declaration of praise as she just, you know, let her her little song. And that in that song that she talks about how, you know, this this is a fulfillment of the covenant promised Abraham. So to me, that was special. That even Mary knew this much about the covenant. Yeah. So. Pretty amazing. Um, but other than that, I mean, Zechariah's speech returns after he he goes with what the father wanted to name John. So I think that's interesting. Um, they had a cultural tradition of naming your son after your father's name, your grandfather's name. I mean, a lot of a lot of families still do that today, even, you know, but this was like a strong, such a strong cultural tradition that God literally had to send an angel to tell him, no, don't name him Zechariah again. Name him John, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like manner with Isaac and, you know, I think we see this um, with Hagar and Ishmael, you know, angel shows up to say, you're going to have a boy and you should name it this. Same thing happens with Mary. So it's interesting. Indeed. That's all I got for you. Um, there's someone in the, in the crowd asking if we have any practical tips on self-circumcision. And guys, I would say do not do it yourself. Find a mullah. 
they're usually in most countries available to you. Um, and they're trained in doing that. And, um, yeah, I would not suggest doing that in your bathroom at your house. Yeah, so, probably wouldn't need to know. Um, I actually know somebody personally who's in his late 30s, if not early 40s, um, who was attending my Bible study. I won't say his name, but he uh, he did um, get set up with somebody who practices. And it was actually, uh, you know, lo and behold, he didn't even know who he was reaching out to. But it, it ended up being a messianic. What would you call him? A hula? hula? What? Mula. I think it's called yeah. a mula. Mula. There it is. So, yeah, he he linked up with him. I think he found him online and they met up at a, uh, a place where they were able to do that and he got it taken care of. And he just Good. said he was a little sore. <laughs> so, you know, it Three can days. be done. It's not Three that days. scary. That's all. You know, that's, that's, uh, seems to be the, what the men of Shechem were, were down for three days before, before that, you know, before the rest of the story happened. But I'm mean, just, the point is, I think the recovery time is like three days if you do it right, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it shouldn't be a big deal. I've had I've had broken feet, ribs, tailbones. Um, I've had all, all kinds of flesh wounds of various types that lasted much, much longer than three days. So, yeah, it shouldn't be that big of a of a sacrifice. <laughs> you made you it want chapter easy. two, brother? Yeah, I'd be glad to. <laughs> all right, here's chapter two. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of the whole empire. This was the first census to take place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from Nazareth in Galilee into Judea, Judea <laughs> to the city of David called Bethlehem, since he was from the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to him in marriage and was expecting a child. Got it. While they were there... The time came for her child to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, a son. Uh, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds residing in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Just then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. <laughs> but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and, in lying, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a great multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after that, uh, after they had seen the child, they spread the message they had received about him. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which was just as the angel had told them. When the eight days until his circumcision had passed, he was named Jesus, Yeshua, and named the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. And when the time of purification, according to the law of Moses, was complete, his parents brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every, every firstborn male shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer the sacrifice specified in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God, saying, Sovereign Lord, you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, your Yeshua, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was spoken about him. 
Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother's his mother Mary, Behold, this child is appointed to cause the rise and fall of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul as well. There was also a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, who was well along in years. She had been married for seven years, and there was, and then was a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming forward at that moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, <clears throat> they went up according to the custom of the feast. When those days were over and they were returning home, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware he had stayed. Assuming he was in their company, they traveled on for a day before they began to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Finally, after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to him and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. Child, why have you done this to us? His mother asked. Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you looking for me? He asked. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? <laughs> but they did not understand the statement he was making to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Very good. Awesome. 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 So we have the birth of the Savior, Yeshua, amongst mankind, 1 Timothy 3.16. As Paul Trezor expressed, this is the manifestation of the promised Son to come, manifested in the flesh. Such a beautiful moment. And uh, just just like Hagar, Ishmael, and, and John, his birth is also announced by an angel, uh, both his conception and his birth. And the Father tells Mary what his name will be. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And they're about six months apart, I think I gathered from the last yeah. reading last chapter yeah yeah that's fascinating um and so this this was interesting to me that there was a uh it straight up tells you this was in the days of caesar, caesar augustus and he decides to take a census which i think is so that is just such like the world right like that i mean this is let me give you the modern day uh terminology for that it's called um the modern day, I know they, they take censuses today, but it's the reason behind trying to count the people you have, right? So it's called contact tracing in modern 2020, 21 society. Um, because the reasoning behind trying to figure out who's who and where where is who is not for po positive purposes. <laughs> for control, right? Tracking. Yeah. And that's why, in my opinion, that there's a reason that this census was to, was to be taken in this same year. Yeah, but, they they knew that the sun would be coming, and they eventually, right under Herod's rule, wanted to kill off all the little ones. Yeah, just like when the three wise men and, and the Matthew account shows up to Herod, and they say, "Hey, you know, we heard that, you know, the, the we heard the Savior was born here," and he's like, "Where?" It's like <laughs> Herod, you know, he's immediately sends out the br the brute squad to go try to kill it. So yeah, and Herod was a, a Roman plant, so. You know, all this information obviously would go back to the head of Babylon, which is Rome at the time, and uh, they would not want this baby to live. So it's fascinating. They have to flee to Egypt for a while, but Mary does give birth to Yeshua in Bethlehem, and which is called the City of David. I always think that's a fun reminder for people studying. Uh, the House of Bread, also called the City of David. A multitude of angels appear as shepherds to announce the birth of Yeshua. Now, this is the interesting part, right? Imagine be in this situation where you know you have these the angels appear in, to the shepherds but then as you as we read in the passage after the initial conversations being had between the shepherds and the angels then a multitude of angels appears so like it, in my opinion and that's why i put the cross reference on that slide for people studying um at home in my opinion that's like first king or second kings chapter six where Elijah shows the king how all the angels had already been 
in the sky the whole time and their chariots and horses rest for battle and ready for war that whole time, the whole time that Elijah is talking with this king and this king is concerned and in fear. And then Elijah's like, all right, Father, please open his eyes so he can see the, the hosts of Israel all round about. Meanwhile, these are not meanwhile, but in like manner, these shepherds in this field are talking to just a, what they think are a couple of angels. But then, boom, they see <laughs> they see a, a multitude. I don't know how many that is, but to me, that's that's a movie scene I would love to see, right? Yeah. Yeah. See a band of angels come in after me. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It That would be amazing to see that. I mean, how, what, like, what does that even look like? It's hard to say. Um, Joseph and Mary have, circ have Yeshua circumcised according to the law. And it, I, I love it that it specifically says multiple times, you know, as according to the law, the customs of the law, like after he completed the duties of the law, after she had finished the days of purification, he brings Yeshua up there. So like they're following the law perfectly as they need to. And, to the point where, um, well, we, we'll get to the Passover in a minute, but there's also these these this prophet and this prophetess in the temple as well, Simeon and then Anna. Any thoughts on those two? Do I have thoughts on? I mean, I think it's just cool that they they also knew about Yeshua, basically. Yeah, it's it says that the father revealed to Simeon he would stay alive until he saw the birth of the Messiah. Right, he would not see death until he saw the Christ. What an amazing blessing it is like just that's an amazing amazing blessing um and then anna as i put in the footnotes says that she's a prophet a prophetess from the tribe of asher so this flies in the face of another prominent theory that you see floating around that uh, the northern tribes of israel of which asher was included when they were in invaded and scattered by the assyrian kings in approximately 7th century bc that somehow they were no longer available to be in covenant until yeshua was born this is a prominent theory if this is the first time you're hearing it a lot of you in the audience have already heard this before this is a prominent theory that's passed around uh, certain biblical communities where they will claim that the, you know everyone from the northern houses uh, that were a part of the northern house, all those tribes that were scattered are also out of covenant until Yeshua came back. And that's why Yeshua had to die on the cross so that they could actually get back into covenant and, and marry God again. Because of the divorce in Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah, because of the divorce language used. And and we just try to remind, love and remind people they were divorced from the land, not from covenant. Dispersed. Father always gives you a chance to come back and repent. And we actually see that in First Chronicles chapter 30 people from the tribe of Asher did come back and repent and celebrate Passover with Hezekiah in that passage and repented. And with great joy, they celebrated Passover. So they that's a covenant meal that requires you to be circumcised and repent to your sins and check your heart and come back and be in faithful covenant and belief with the Father. As well as Tobit, How, we see in Tobit doing the same. Yep, same thing with Tobit, who is also part of the tribe of Naphtali, who was scattered by the Assyrian kings of the northern house. So in, in like, I think it's beautiful that Anna is mentioned right before it talks about Joseph and Mary constantly keeping Passover, because Anna's from the tribe of Asher, who was grafted back in through faith and belief by keeping Passover in First Chronicles 30. Uh, I just think that's beautiful. Nice connection. So beautiful. Yeah. It so, is. Uh, and I can't imagine yeah. the excitement they must have been trying to contain because after having read Enoch, surely these guys had read the, the testaments of the 12 patriarchs, just all the promises of the son, you know, no, no telling what versions of the Septuagint and what how things read in there. You know, we've seen from presentations you've done that there were scriptures that spoke clearly of the Messiah, that he was prophesied to die for three days and all of the promises of him coming with the kingdom and eternal life afterwards. So that that could have only been one of the most exciting moments of their life to say he's he's here, he's coming, it's really he's happening. Here. Yeah. And he's a little big baby, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet baby Jesus. Yes. Sweet baby Jesus. What an amazing moment though, just to to know that like literally Emmanuel, right? That he got his Elohim status has now come in the flesh. How mm -hmm. interesting, huh? The mystery. Um, so as Mary, how when Mary is blessing, uh, excuse me, when when uh, Simeon is prophesying and blessing Yeshua in this moment, holding him as a baby, did he say, oh, Yahweh Almighty, the creator and the father of heaven and earth, you came in the flesh, you're here now. No. Did he say that, Wes? Nobody believed that in the scriptures. No, they didn't. They knew better. He was to send his son. That was always the plan. The father did not clone himself and send a clone of himself. He sent his son to become our Messiah. That was the plan. 
So uh, anything to talk about with the Passover, uh, his parents keeping Passover and Yeshua sticking, stick, sticking back to talk to the teachers? Yeah, I'd like to point out that a lot of people have passed around this teaching that the first half of the feasts, right, the spring feasts were already fulfilled by Yeshua's first coming. And so, you know, some people would take that that concept of being fulfilled as we don't have to do that anymore. And so, unfortunately, that these teachings that get passed out can lead and feed into that that way of thinking. But um, we see Yeshua in Luke 22 himself say that I will not eat of the Passover again. The context there is Passover until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, as well as in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 of the Septuagint. We see that the um, day of the Lord. The day of Yeshua's coming is also called a Passover, that that will be a Passover day feast. You know, on what calendar that we're all trying to keep, we can't say, so we can't know the exact day. But whatever time of the year it will be, it will be on a Passover that the Father is ordained. And so, yeah, that that is an eternal commandment, too. Yes, it is. Yeah. We, we can't go to the temple. We don't have a, a temple ordained on earth, but we do have a high priest who serves in a true tabernacle, the heavenly temple above. Yep. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, He is. Yeah. And now you said it best. I'm not going to add to it. You said it best, brother. Right. I'll just leave it at that. Um, Guys, guess what? Since we we're just looking at Simeon prophesying over Yeshua, it's now time for a new segment here on Torah Portions that we're going to call Come Let Us Reason Together. All right. <laughs> All right. Guys, we just want to take a quick minute and we'll look a quick question. We can just talk this out, brainstorm this. Simeon, it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Reminds me of the, the consummation of the ages, a synonym for the day of the Lord. Okay. So you think that the, the term waiting for the consolation of Israel is waiting That's for the That's the first thing that comes to mind. I can't say for sure. What were your thoughts on it? Well, I tried to look up this word. Right. To try to figure out if you look it up in, you know, just most generic English dictionaries, it talks about consoling someone, uh, the state of being consoled or comforted. Right. And I'm sitting there thinking, all right, kind of it kind of lines up with Mary's Mary's proclamation and prayer. Right. That you would send yours to to uh, avenge us or enemies and to to protect us and to guide us. And I thought, OK, that's interesting. But yet Yeshua did not accomplish that in his physical earthly life in his first coming, nor was he prophesied to accomplish that in his first coming. So it's almost as if. They were, they knew that now that this boy is here, God's plan, like we're seeing God's plan in action, and they were praising God for the end result of that plan, which is the second coming, where Israel is is dwelling in safety, and then the kingdom comes, and the wicked are routed, and that kind of thing. So I looked up the Greek word for that word console used in this passage, and it's this word uh, paraclesium. I think I said that right, paraclesium. Okay. And it just means a, a sense of encouragement or calling to one's aid. Um, it, it's like it also uses the word comfort, right? But then if I, I went down and I looked at different evidences of it, and it actually says that uh, it's it, it's like expounding upon the nature of the Greek word. And it says it's properly a calling or an urging uh, to be done by someone that's close or a personal exhortation uh, to be delivered or someone that's evidence that stands up in God's court. And I thought it was interesting how they tied those ideas together. Um, it also men mentions a, an intimate call. And then, um, but it still goes back to the idea of an appeal or a comfort or an encouragement. And so I, I thought it was kind of interesting that um, it uses this specific word as it tries to explain why Simeon was so happy and prophesying over baby Yeshua and calling and thinking that introducing Simeon into this story, saying that he was a devout and righteous man who had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. And so therefore, if it does mean something that's to, to comfort Israel, to encourage them, uh, an intimate calling, well, that would make sense with what we read from John the Baptist, the angel prophesying over him, how he would fulfill this sense of repentance to the people to prepare the way of the Lord. So that between John the Baptist prepping their hearts and Yeshua coming in and making their hearts joyful and encouraged by giving them proper doctrine and telling them he would fulfill the covenant and get them to that eternal life and that eternal kingdom, which Yeshua preached the gospel of the kingdom. Therefore, Yeshua embodies the idea of comfort and encouragement to Israel. And then later on in the story, he says, I must go so that I can send the comforter 
that ties in with it too. So, you know, that the Holy Spirit yeah. comforts and we have greater access through that. So it's just really kind of like a consolation of Israel. It's just an homage to like everything that was to come almost. Or is there yeah. a more specific moment that you think, or just the events there? What no, no, I, I think I, I think what I'm saying is like they were in a time of darkness. This is what um, yeah. Isaiah chapter nine, and uh, and and I think it's a uh, Matthew chapter three talks about when Yeshua, you know, he was a fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied that Yahweh that the Father would send his servant to the to a land of darkness, meaning a land without Torah. Um, yep. And so, therefore, because they had this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees run around and muddling the waters of theology and confusing people. Mm -hmm. And so the people were being discouraged when you don't have proper sound doctrine, it takes away your hope. Yeah. You, you, you do not have a proper vision to understand what God's promised you and where you're going. So you get discouraged and there was idolatry in the land as well. Um, you know, obviously well, we see Yeshua, unclean Yeshua, spirits running rampant. That's true. Yeah. Yeshua was casting those out left and right. He calls the Pharisees a wicked and adulterous generation, den of vipers, snakes, white yeah. sepulchers, you know, all these, he has all these yeah. things to describe them with. So yeah, they were definitely in some darkness. I see that. Yeah. So I just think it's an interesting little concept that this, this older gentleman, um, just such, he's also a devout man. You know, I put him in the same category as Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's father. You know, um, where he saw he just out of his own joy, he prophesies uh, at the moment he sees Yeshua, you know, the, the Messiah to come or that's here. And um, because all of it leads to the kingdom come, that's the that's the fulfillment of all this covenant we've been talking about with Abraham all the way up to the consolation with it, with which is Yeshua being a part of that process to bring the covenant promises to us, make it a reality. So I just think I think it's beautiful. But. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for chopping it up with me in our segment that we are calling "Come." Let us reason together. The light <laughs> leaks are beautiful. Transitions and everything looking great, brother. And we, guys, we would like to actually hear from you real quick before we jump into our last chapter that we're going to read from Romans four. We just want to hear from you. Wes and I, during our discussion on chapter two, we had talked about, you know, th this wonderful concept of Jesus being his, his second coming is what actually fulfills the Passover. So that's kind of a big deal. Like, you know, Brother Wes, he quoted from Luke and Matthew. That's I believe it's in Luke 24, uh, verse 22 or 26. That Yeshua directly says this feast will be fulfilled when the kingdom comes. Should be Luke 22. Yeah, it should be Luke 22. I think it's verse uh, 20 or 22 or 24 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he basically, he directly tells us that this 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 feast will not be fulfilled till the kingdom comes. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, a lot of people don't realize that because they think that Yeshua's first coming is what fulfilled Passover. But that's not, that's kind of not the idea of Passover. What If you could succinctly explain the idea of Passover from, uh, I don't know, kingdom of god perception um what would you say that it is oh boy hot seat okay so <laughs> passover is the the first of the feast days right that uh it it was representative of deliverance basically right we see in in when the israelites are leaving egypt in, in the exodus before they left they were commanded to um slay a goat lamb and uh put it over the um, put the blood over the doorway and that that mm -hmm. would protect them from the firstborn being taken out. And so, uh, you know, even from that moment, we see people be able to be grafted in and do that because there were Egyptians that left with the Israelites out of the Exodus. And so they were grafted in because they took part in that behavior. If you see, you know, a bunch of people doing the same thing and they're telling you, you, you want to do this so that your firstborn and all your cattle and everything aren't taken out. So they're, they're joining in. Um, and it's a, a fellowship meal that you would have there with that lamb and the goat. Um, and that that is one of the, the first appointed times of three where people are commanded to gather. Right. So they would come mm -hmm. to the temple. Yeah, 23. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, and that this is something that's been kept in heaven by the angels since creation. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it would also represent like, you know, the on the day of the Lord, there is that wrath that comes. And to be able to escape that wrath, you want to be covered by the lamb. There you go. Yeah. So that's that's why it can't be fulfilled until the kingdom comes. 
because it is the wrath and indignation of the Lord that is promised and, and idiomatically referred to as the wrath of the Lamb on at the second coming of Yeshua. And that is what, what we're spared from, you know, the the the, the saints, the ecclesia, the, the body, the gathering is spared at the first resurrection from that wrath. So that's why Yeshua would say here in Luke 22, 15 to 16, that you know, I'll tell you, I'll not eat it again with you until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Right. Because I think it's interesting there that, you know, a lot of people would take that to mean that Yeshua is not drinking anything and, and eating or something maybe in, until that time. Whereas he says, I won't do it with you again. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking to his disciples. He's disciples. like, I'm not going to see you guys again to do this again with you until the kingdom's here and we're all resurrected in the kingdom doing it again together. So, mm -hmm. and I, I honestly wonder if this is the Matthew 22 wedding supper of the Lamb is the Passover, the fulfillment of the Passover in the kingdom. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's and by I the think. way, the word the word fulfilled doesn't mean until it's done away with in the kingdom. No, no. it's an eternal ordinance, guys. It means until we do it again in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's what that word fulfilled in that passage means. So anyway, yeah, thanks for uh, expounding on that, brother. And we can jump over to Romans 4 if I think it's my turn to read, right? Yes. All right. I'll jump on this real quick. Romans 4, 1 through 6. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, has discovered? If Abraham was indeed justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the wages of the worker are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And David speaks likewise of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those, blessed are they whose lawless acts are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessing only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. In what context was it credited? Was it after his circumcision or before? It was not after, but before. After he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. And guys, I don't know if you guys caught that or not, but I, I can expound this later. But he literally just said the circumcision is a sign of your resurrection and the, the, the perfect state of righteousness you receive in that body at the resurrection. Uh -huh. So then he is the father of all who believe but are not circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the uncirc of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is this is a quick caveat where he's alluding back to chapter two, where he tried to tell you that your circumcision doesn't mean anything if you're not doing the commandments, if you're not walking in the footsteps of the faith like Abraham. That's right. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world was not given through the law but through the righteousness that comes by faith, the resurrection that comes when Yeshua raised you from the dead. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith is useless and the promise is, is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may rest on, on grace, which that word means favor, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it's written, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God in whom we, he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being what does not yet exist. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he acknowledged the decrepitness of his body since he was about 100 years old and the lifelessness of Sarah's womb. Yet he did not waver through disbelief in the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God was able to do what he promised. This is why it's credited to him as righteousness. Now, the words it was credited to him were written not only for Abraham, but also for us, to whom righteousness will be credited at the resurrection. For us who believe in him, who, G who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our trespass, and he's raised to life for our justification. So well much, said. so much, yeah, <laughs> Paul, right? Well said, Paul, well said. 
It was. Yeah, he was it's such a shame so many people want to reject him and question him like they do because he's one of the greatest authors of commentary on scripture to help you understand what was written yes. for us. Yeah, he's I mean, he's even trying to break down little bitty terms like and the term it was credited right. means this. Like he's trying to break it down for you, you know? Yeah. But if you don't understand the implicit inherit you know, just the 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 understood idea of the resurrection promised to you in the covenant, you're you're not going to have a clue why he keeps referring to this idea of the righteousness that comes through faith. You're you're not going to get that transition moment of what he's trying to say. It's like, look, whether you're in the flesh, whether you're circumcised or not, if you're if you're not following the footsteps of the faith, and if you're not you know in the faith, which is the faith of Abraham, if you're not in that disposition of doing the commandments and believing in God, that he's he's going to raise you from the dead if you practice this behavior. Well, then. You know, you're you're working towards something that you you can't get you can't get the the credit you can't be credited righteousness to receive a wage for that type of work, right? You have to believe in the faith of you. You have to believe. I'm saying this so poorly. I apologize. Let me back up. Let me okay. back up. Because I'm trying to I'm trying to summarize, but man, it's he he hits so many different facets of this as he tries to talk. So he's he's trying to share with people. Look, in his day, he's battling what's called the circumcision party. This is why this is an extenuation from chapter two, where he already tried to address the people that were truly Jews were people that did the commandments regardless of their circumcision status. Right? So he's trying to address this bad semantic argument and this bad theology from, the, from the circumcision party of the Pharisees in the background of his life. Okay. People that are trying to go to his converts among the Romans and steal his converts. Okay, so this is why he's talking and trying to break down these ideas about whether you're circumcised or not. You got to be in the faith, which is the footsteps. You got to be doing the behavior of Abraham, just like Jesus tells us in John eight. If you're a seed of Abraham, you'll do the deeds of Abraham. It's the same message that yeah. that he's trying to say here, and he's faith trying to without share works. with people. Sorry, right, faith, faith without, without works, works is dead, just as works without faith is dead. Yes, yes, and he's trying to explain to you that this faith that that you get to where you get this righteousness by faith that's you get to that perfect righteous body at the resurrection that is promised to you in the covenant that you are made eternal you're made without sin ezekiel 36 he puts your his spirit and his laws and his ordinances in your heart that you do them you know what i'm saying like this has always been the promise of the covenant and paul assumes his converts whom he'd already taught all these things that they understood these ideas and that's why he's trying to address them by explaining circumcision is the sign of your resurrection to come. You only get to that point of being resurrected by faith because you can't do it for yourself. You have to trust that God will do it through his son to raise you through the, from the dead. So this is why if even if you are circumcised, you better be doing the behavior of Abraham too, which is doing the commandments. So therefore you can be expecting to be raised to, raised to eternal life like Jesus was. And that doesn't mean that circumcision isn't one of the commandments. It was just being treated as like this gateway to the covenant, whereas they they abandoned the rest of the the walk, right? Yeah. And so yeah, we even see I'm reminded of Revelation twenty one eight that uh, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and moral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, they will have their part in the lake of fire at the second death. And so even unbelieving, right? So the, all these things I would say are from Torah, right? Uh, murderers, right? Immoral immorality sorcery idolaters lying torah forbids all of these things and so it's it's telling you right there if you don't uh if you don't have belief as well in in the most high god then you can't even be in covenant with him to to where these yeah. other believe these other um actions will even matter yeah amen yeah that's that's a truly truly a good statement so that's that's why I tried to summarize um this the simple concepts Romans 4 is tricky for a lot of people if you don't understand the covenant promised to Abraham, like we read earlier, if you don't understand how that covenant is fulfilled through the Messiah coming, which is at that at that day of of first century AD, it was he he arrived to a generation that was being browbeaten into depression and lack of hope. And so he becomes their encouragement that the father is going to accomplish the covenant to Abraham. And so this is Abraham was credited a righteousness because he would believe the promises spoken to him by Yahweh. Now, this isn't the Catholic idea of imputed righteousness. This, this doesn't that. mean that he suddenly had perfect behavior and did all the commandments perfectly. No, this just means just like Paul says in the let me go to it real quick. Paul says in the in the verse, it's like similar, we will be credited righteousness. Where is it where to go? Um who was credited to saying this? Well, 
remember what verse it was. I think you passed it. Um, Already passed it? Credited him as righteousness. In what context? I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, the, that Catholic term of imputed righteousness, people just mm -hmm. uh, abandon the definition of what righteousness means, which does have to do with your specific individual behavior. And then, um, there it is. but yeah, the real imputed righteousness happens at the resurrection, right? <laughs> that's that's when yes, righteousness yeah. is imputed to us. Yeah, again, they mess up the timing of, of the process. Verse 24 says, but also for us, it says it was credited to him, that phrase that applies not only for Abraham, but also to us, to whom righteousness will be credited. That's a future mm -hmm. tense statement. There now, is. A lot of people like to say, no, it means if he's, he's talking to people that, that get saved and they're get, getting that righteous meal. I'm like, no, he's talking to people that are already saved. He's talking to his disciples. He's teaching his disciples in Rome proper theology about the covenant. So yeah. this is this is a future tense statement. You will be, this is why I put you know in the footnotes here, first night five and Ezekiel 36. At the resurrection, you're given this perfect behavior, this perfect righteous behavior. Righteousness means right behavior, guys. Mm -hmm. So it says for and that's because if we believe Jesus was raised from the dead, well, then also Jesus, verse 25, is raised to life for our justification, right? For our future resurrection and, and justification to God. Right. This Here's is why, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, and, that, and that is accomplished through the, the vehicle of his priesthood that he embodies. So this is where, yeah, I just try to break it down as, as simply as possible that um, so people can understand this idea of, of being credited righteousness, right? Unfortunately, uh, the Catholic Church, I think it was about the third century AD, they stole that idea and called it imputed righteousness. And a lot of their Catholic philosophers from Italy started using that term in their writings and saying, well, now you're now you're righteous by the, the righteous get imputed to you by your faith in Christ. Which feeds into this in, idea that people have is that I can go to church on Sunday and behave and act however I want to for the rest of the week, or I'm righteous, Jesus made me righteous, and then their behavior doesn't line up with that. And so, yeah, the, right. It's important distinction to make to understand the difference here. In modern churches and some modern church circles, the terminology you hear that that is this idea of imputed righteousness we're trying to debunk. In modern churches will say, Oh, well, see, now that you believe in Jesus, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you in all your faults. He sees Jesus. And yet every man will still be judged by his work and deeds. Yeah, I, I know, work. right? I know, right? It's such a it's such an easily debunked teaching but it's propagated so often because they're trying to they're trying to encourage people with their misunderstanding of this term and this how this is applied and so i'm not literally i'm not like calling out to disparage the pastors but it's they've just been taught this poor catholic-based theology of imputed righteousness and substitutionary atonement um and so therefore they 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 come up with phrases like that to try to communicate it to a 12 year old oh put your faith in jesus and then all your bad behavior God doesn't see that. He just sees Jesus. And you're like, ah, it's not kind of how, it's not exactly how he describes it in his word, but there's no repentance you know. in that theology. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it, it's not, it's not sound. It's, it's slippery. Mm -hmm. uh, it also says the circumcision was given as a sign of the resurrection where righteousness, that's your eternal right behavior is given to those who believe in faith. I, you know, it was, I don't, I don't remember when, you know, this became uh, my understanding of, actual circumcision being a sign of the covenant. But hopefully that encourages people listening, guys. When when in Genesis 17, as we read earlier, when the father says to Abraham, I'm giving you a sign of the covenant, an eternal instruction for, for circumcising the male member uh, on the eighth day, and this is a sign of the covenant. Well, it's it's not a birth, it's not a sign of the covenant like the Pharisees were using it to be like, oh, well, you, you know, this is this is the only way you get into covenant. No, it was actually literally supposed to be a symbol that represented your future resurrection. Like, how beautiful is that? It is. Like, every time you go to the bathroom, you look down and remind you of your first future, future resurrection, guys. Yeah. So you can stay away from doing the bad things. <laughs> like, how amazing. Because, you know, you have to deal with it. You know, this is something you have to deal with as a man multiple times a day. So multiple times a day, he's trying to remind you of the promise to be fulfilled when you get your eternal life, your glorified heart, and you get to spend eternity with the Father and the Son. It is. Yeah. It is. I just, fun, fact I, about I it's fun fact about circumcision that my, my girlfriend over at Wildly Unpopular um, taught me was that she was in her video about vaccinations, right? About, well, the, the V word. They, uh, they She was talking about how you know, kids, uh, babies, when they're born are usually circumcised, like the day they're born. Um, and they, 
but before they do, they give them a vitamin K shot to help to make sure the blood can coagulate because God has designed it to where we don't need the vitamin K V and that shot that they give there. Um, because the blood coagulates, we develop enough vitamin K as, as babies and infants on the eighth day. There's a perfect proof for why God says on the eighth day to do the circumcision is that the this vitamin K there in the coagulation of the blood. I thought that was really interesting. Y'all go check out her videos at Wildly Unpopular. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thought. Good, good medical uh, testament to the Father's truth. Um, and lastly, guys, I just want to r- remind us that Abraham is metaphorically called the father of faith to those who are circumcised because they practice the law, because he also practiced the law in faith. Right? Abraham is metaphorically considered our father because he believed in the resurrection to eternal life and lawful right behavior in the kingdom of God. And so that is the promise of the covenant. So this is why Paul's breaking down this chapter, the multiple different ways he we refer to Abraham as the father of our faith. So I think it's fitting because you have, you know, Yeshua in Luke 16 telling this parable about being in Abraham's bosom. So they kind of looked to Abraham in their in their culture as being someone that was intimately tied to their, you know, to the covenant promises and to being someone they looked up to uh, yeah. as an example. They, they call him like the father of, of all the nations and descendants, just as Yahweh called him. Right. And so it's yeah. it's it's fitting that they would say, I go to lay with my fathers, you know, before that. And now they're saying after Abraham, they're saying, I'm going to go to Abraham's bosom because he's the father of all those fathers. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wes, we're at the end of our tour portion today. Any any last words before we, before we take off? Are Man, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'd like to to see some other guests you have on me uh, on, uh, you know, with uh, working out tour portions with you as well, because it's a great yeah, time yeah. to learn. Great chance to get to hear some commentary from sean and, and help make sense of more things and i'm just honored to be here always grateful to be asked to join you um we will be back again for season two of uncommon ground and i just wanted to tease and shout out that i'm going to be doing a, a new show on my channel west plays music it's going to be called fight the good fight and I'm, I'm having a lot of fun working on that and so y'all look out for that but otherwise thank you yeah, sean it's going to be about spiritual warfare right it is. Yeah, we're going to be covering okay. lots of different aspects. There's so many facets to spiritual warfare where, you know, you got to look at the demonic oppression and um, possession and and deliverance, prayer and repentance, what it means to be able to to fight the good fight and how to walk out our, our faith walk and have some good battle strategies for life. Biblical battles, battle strategies at that. So that's what I'm looking forward to doing. I look forward to it. Yeah, I think it's be great. I I'd love it if you join me for some episodes, too. For sure. Yeah. Just let me know when. Um, yeah, guys, uh, we'll be doing like like I've announced, we're doing kind of a double header uh, for the past two weekends on tour portions tomorrow. Uh, standard time, 11 a.m., um, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, we'll be doing tour portions again, going through um, the chapters uh, 18 through 22. And Marlo Eugene will be joining me for that tomorrow. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a different take. We'll talk about different things, different chapters. So hopefully you guys will, will be excited to learn more tour portions tomorrow as well you just said you're having marlo on for tour portions tomorrow yeah great awesome dude i look forward to that yeah yeah be good so uh, yeah about shalom peaceful rest yes of as we step into the shabbat for a lot of people hope you do guys i i think tonight i will be doing a milk and meat i'm still preparing um some things so i'll let you guys know about that soon but yeah thank you everyone for being here and being in the chat Please hit that thumbs up. Please, please uh, smash it into eternity so that uh, the father can help us push this video into the algorithms, algorithms, um, regardless of YouTube and what they think. And so we get his word out to the people as fast as possible. So thank you guys for your prayers for us. Thank you for support. Thank you for uh, always being asking good questions. And um, these I just want to I just want to let, let everyone know that uh, the, the tour portions that we've been doing with Genesis are massive. This is why it takes us so long. We're going to get to other portions that are not as many chapters and we'll have some time to take some questions from cool. people. So I know a lot of people miss that and I miss that. And so these are just, I just try to be respectful of Wes's time and I've got, I got to prepare for another broadcast. So, you know, Make there's a, there's a lot. Yeah. These are, these are just huge portions guys uh, in Genesis. And, and I'm trying to be wise about how I do this, but we will have episodes in the future where we take questions. Okay. Awesome. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Wes. Bless you, brother. Have a good Shabbat. Happy Sabbath, brother. All right. You too, brother. We'll see you guys soon.